All right, everyone, tonight is going to be a very special show because what I've done is I've combined all of my Bigfoot encounters that involved military vets. That's going to be one encounter happened in the jungles of Vietnam during the Vietnam War from one of our soldiers. Another one is a French Foreign Legion soldier that had encounters. I know a lot of you out there like to listen while you're working or maybe while you're working out and you don't like to have to continuously take your phone out of your pocket and click on the next video. So this is going to be a long show, but I think everyone out there is going to enjoy it. Before we get started, make sure and hit that subscribe button. Also, give me a thumbs up on the video and leave me a comment down below. Tell me what you thought about the show or maybe some of your opinions on some of the encounters that are in the show tonight. But let's just go ahead and get right into it. Tonight, I'd like to welcome Robert to the show. Robert, thanks for coming on, man. Well, you're most welcome. Robert, won't you tell us how old you were when you had this encounter? I was 20 years old. And why don't you let everyone know where you were at and what you were doing there? I was a Marine Corps radio operator, and I was in Vietnam. Okay. How long were you stationed in Vietnam for? I was in there a year. A year? Okay. Robert, why don't you just tell us what happened and lead us into it, you know, talk about what you were doing, what the landscape looked like, and then just walk right into the encounter, and then I'll let you tell it, and if I have any questions at the end, I'll, I'll kind of ask it once we get there, okay? Okay, sure. Take it away. Uh, I was a Marine Corps radio operator, and I was in a, a recon platoon. And uh, we ha were having trouble getting communications with one of our other platoons that, that were way out in the field in the middle of nowhere uh, beyond what our radios would work. So they dropped me off on a hillside uh, between where we were at and uh, the, the platoon, hoping we would get calm. If I set up a uh, remoted radio, I, I set up an antenna uh, on the side of the hill. Uh, forward of our position and was hoping to get communications with a platoon in the field. And then I was, I, I sat there for three days talking to the guys in the field and relaying in, any information back to headquarters. Um, I was on the top of a hill. I don't know where I was at. It was somewhere north of Da Nang. And as near as I can remember, I, I tore up all my notes. I kept, I kept a diary of everything, but I, I tore it up when I got stationed with the uh, Arvin Battalion, and we were in danger of being overrun, so I destroyed my diary. Um, yeah, and they did get overrun, but thankfully I wasn't there when it happened. Uh, and so I was sitting there, and uh, like I say, I was, all I had was a little shelter half that I'd made out of my poncho on the side of this hill. I'd sit there for 24 hours a day uh, and talking back and forth with the radio to the platoon out in the field and then relaying the information back. It was uh, very boring, uh, very boring and kind of scary because I was more or less by myself. Um, and, uh, and then one day things kind of actually kind of livened up there for a few minutes when I had this encounter with a, what I first thought I, I had a, a sheath. I was on a hillside that was about a, it was about a 30 degree slope and it was pretty barren. There wasn't anything over knee high growing. And it, was, it was a lot of erosion on the side of the hill from the heavy rains. And it sloped down to a scrub, what I call scrub forest. The forest was no more than about 15 feet tall, real thick scrub. And uh, it started at the beginning of the hill. And uh, I could look down. The tr there was a trail that led down there, and I could observe the trail. And I watched. I had com wire, and there was com wire from other other outfits too that had been there. And there was a sheath of com wire, which is I don't know, it's just regulation electric wire. It's not very thick. I, I, I don't tell you, I can't tell you how thick it is. Not very thick. And there was a sheath of a and a half in diameter running down the hill, and. uh I'm sitting there, just sitting there, the side of the hill with nothing to do, and uh, all of a sudden I, I notice my the comm wire is moving. Something is pulling on the communicate the sheath of comm wire. And what the you know? I was 
I got my attention and I looked down the hill. I can't, I was, it could have been more than about 70 meters away. And I could see what I thought was somebody squatted down, pulling on the wire. And, and of course I got my attention and my heart was racing because I'm here. I am. I'm by myself in the middle of nowhere. And, um, I, I was praying that, you know, this, this is it, you know, this is a firefight with me by myself and, and my heart's pounding. And then I noticed that whatever it is, isn't really paying any attention to me. And, and I'm looking and I'm looking for, you know, the usual dark uniform of black PJs. And I noticed it doesn't, it doesn't have that. And it's not wearing any headgear and I can't really make it out very good. It's squatted down. So I'm watching it, I'm, and I'm watching for probably it was a couple of minutes. And, I, and I'm all the time I'm watching over the sights of my rifle. I'm ready to pull the trigger. And um, so I, after a while, I'm not afraid anymore. So I grab the comm wire and I pull back as hard as I can. Well, then it gave a, it pulled back too, and then it stood up. And then I could see that it wasn't a man. It was uh. It was, it was kind of dark. It was right at the edge of the of the of the scrub, and then it turned, and the sun the sunlight hit it, and I could see it was covered with reddish. It looked bright reddish hair, like you would see on a like an orangutan. Uh, that's the first thing I thought it's colored like an orangutan. Well, I knew there's no orangutans in Vietnam, and this thing is built like a man. It was probably about five and a half feet tall. I could judge it by the scrub. And I'd seen people come up that path before. We had a Vietnamese that had come up that path before. And I'm looking at it. What the hell is it? And it's looking at me. And I, we look at each other for a little bit. And I'm, and I, and I'm not afraid anymore because I can see it's not human. But I'm kind of get, trying to get a look at it. And the face, I couldn't really make the face out too well. But the face wasn't colored. I was looking for this more. It looked more like it was darker colored than a than a Caucasian man. Um, and I could see it had. It wasn't. I thought maybe. Uh, well, they got macaques in Vietnam. I'm real familiar with primates. I've studied them my whole life. I I love animals. Always have. I was in Vietnam. I was in heaven because of all the different animals I got to see. I can see this isn't a, this isn't built like an ape. It's got. It stands up like a man. It looked at me, and we looked at each other, and I I just watched it, and then it, then it turned and walked away down a path, and I watched it walk away. It walked on two legs. It didn't shuffle shuffle along like a monkey that's not used to walking. It walked just like a man. Uh, there was not, no tail that I could see. It just strolled away like nothing happened. It didn't pay me. It wasn't afraid. It didn't seem to be afraid at all. And uh, I went about my business. I really, at the time, I didn't really uh, attach much importance to it. You know, I had bigger concerns before because of where I was at. I'm just glad I didn't have to fire my weapon because that would open up a whole different can of worms. Um, I never really thought much about it, you know, until until later. You know, when I have a chance, you know, being in Vietnam and under my situation, I didn't have a lot of time to think about other stuff. But uh, it, it was. Uh, it was, it was quite an encounter, and, and then when I, in the last 20 years, I've read about similar encounters from other people that were stationed in Vietnam, and and, uh, and actually our, one of our other platoons, our second platoon, had a, uh, an encounter that was a lot more active, uh, you know, interactive encounter uh, with whatever these things are. I, I, I'm pretty sure this is some kind of man. Uh, Can you go into active. that encounter? Uh, yeah, as much as I can. Uh, at the time, uh, this was the second, our second platoon. It was eight guys in the recon outfit. We're out in the uh, somewhere in the middle of the jungle, and um, in the middle of the night, they uh, they uh, they made contact, and uh, they had to be extracted. Well, this is that's a big, very big deal in the middle of the night, and the next m- morning. They were back in, and there was just a big. Everybody was all excited. What the hell happened, you know? And, and the and the one, the one person that initiated the contact, um, who has since passed away, uh, was he was nineteen and kind of kind of a goofy guy. 
and I uh, and I went next door to the next ten over. He was there, and he'd already they'd already talked to the S one and stuff. And they some people were saying he was crazy, but he he told me I'll never forget. He said he was attacked by gorillas. Uh, they had set up in a perimeter in the jungle on the canopy, and he's sitting there. And he said this thing come out of the out of the brush and grabbed his rifle barrel and tried to drag him in the brush, and he fired his weapon. Of course, everybody else got up and fired. And he said there were several of them, and, I, and he said they were gorillas. They were gorillas. And I said, there are no gorillas in Vietnam. He said, well, then they were chimpanzees. I said, how big were they? He says, as big as I am. And he was about 5'10". And he was still scared. He, I'll never forget, he was still scared as, as all it could be. He, didn't, he was just petrified. And um, everybody thought he was nuts. And the other guys, you know, they didn't, I don't think they saw anything. But, of course, they, they popped the flare and, and got out of there. But he, he definitely uh, was scared about what happened. And I never heard any more about it. Next up, we're going to have Lane Hightower from the Cryptid Brother Investigations channel on YouTube. We're going to get started right at the beginning of the encounter. So here we go. Yeah, back in around, oh, I was about 1995. I graduated high school around 92, 93. So it had been about 95. And at that time, I was working for a, a horse ranch. And, oh, I was taking, back then, we were taking care of about 16 Mustangs. We would take people out on trail rides. And, and actually, we had one, two, and three-hour trail rides that we used to. Uh, run at that particular point in time, and we'd have a cookout with them and uh, with people that paid to, to go on horseback. And you know, it was a great it was great times back then. I loved to be around horses and still do. But uh, at that time, I, I worked for a horse ranch. Well, that evening, after I had uh, taken care of the, the, the mustangs and owned them, brushed them out, and, and fed them, and and cleaned their hooves out and everything, and put up the, the tack and clocked out and. I met a, a friend of mine at that time, and I had called him earlier that afternoon. Hey, man, when I come over uh, uh, after work, uh, I head to your house. Uh, we'll hop in your pit, or we'll go catfishing that night. And he said, yeah, sounds like a good deal. And at that time, he, he worked for a heat and air company. So we kind of like had the same schedule, so it kind of worked out great for us at that particular time. So I met him, drove the old Jeep in the town one night, and brought my uh my uh, catfish rods and reels and, and and old doe bait and everything else back then that i had and a nice chest and coleman lantern and all that and we uh transferred all that over his pickup at that time and stopped at a local grocery store and headed out of town west went over the uh north canadian river matter of fact out in western oklahoma at that particular time and he said, he said, yeah, I said, Dad, I said, do you have a, a great place to go? He said, yeah, matter of fact, I do. He said, it's about a mile south and of, of, of the main highway that we're on and back about a mile east. And then we'll run back off to that North Canadian River bottom. I said, great. So we finally made it down to that bottom, and, and uh, we had to make a, a U-turn. It was pretty tight quarters turning that pickup back around. We backed up that truck. and So... <clears throat> But we backed up the truck, and it was now. This was probably oh, around July, June, July. Of course, it was it was the dead of summer, and it was pretty hot. And I remember it had a full moon that evening. And I had as soon as we parked and backed up, got out, let the tailgate down. And what we were going to do was just put the Coleman lantern on 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 the tailgate, have our cooler, and we had you know some drinks, we had some cold beer, and we had things to, to eat and and stuff like that, and and I had got out, and we were setting up the, the uh, all of our gear, uh, and getting everything ready, I uh, got the comb in, and, and getting everything ready, and I had to go utilize, and go to the restroom, and so I did that, and popped back in the truck, and he told Ed at that time, he said, hey Lane, he said, let me have one of those cold beers, I said, sure, so I popped a beer for him, and got one myself, and I had no longer taken one sip of that beer, and I noticed to my peripheral on my right side, which would have been the north looking out of the passenger side of the truck, because we, we had the door swung open. We were just sitting in the truck at that time. And, of course, the truck was away parked, and I looked over, and I saw something moving. And, again, this is full moon, 
it was so bright. It was actually a beautiful night. You didn't need a flashlight. Of course, we had a Coleman, but it wasn't fired up yet. And I looked over, and I thought, what in the heck is that? And he was talking to me about his day, uh, working on heat and air. And, of course, I was sitting there listening to him. And I kept seeing this walk, this, this whatever it was. It was coming across the field. And it was probably around, oh, probably 175 to 200 yards out. But it was still, it was so clear that evening and so bright. I could clearly see what I was looking. I was looking at this object, but it was, the, 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 the way it was so flowing, the mechanical movement was just almost like a, a ghost, like an apparition coming across this field. And the field that it was coming across was a wheat field. It was a huge wheat field. And as he was whisked, talking to me, I kept looking at this, and I thought, wow, that's not a deer. Of course, that's too big to be a deer. And it's, in a matter of fact, it looks upright. So I, I elbowed Ed at the time with my left elbow, and I said, hey. He said, what's that? I said, what in the heck is that? He goes, what? I said, look out in that field. So I, I said, see my finger? He goes, yeah. I said, I'm going to point, follow the tip of my index finger. I'm going to point out there. I said, look at this. It was literally like trotting across this wheat field. He said, yeah, I see that. And I said, what? And the heck is that? He looked at it and he goes, I have no idea. He says, whatever it is, it's huge. And I said, yeah, no joke. Now, we were whispering. We weren't loud or anything like that. We saw this, whatever it was, go gracefully. And it just, it just a, almost like a, a ghost would float across this, this field. At that. That's what it looked like. You know, heck, as far as I know at the time, it looked like a ghost. But it was just far enough out where I, I, I could just barely identify, but I could still see that whatever it was, it, the, the, the light was reflecting off of it just a little bit. And this thing went across the field and then went into the river bottom along the trail line by the river. And I looked at him, and when it disappeared, I, I thought, now I, I started getting a little concerned. And, of course, I was, I was nervous, and and uh, he was too. And he says, man, what was that, Lane? I said, I have no idea. He said, was it, could that have been somebody jacking around with us here at night? And I said, no. I said, the nearest farm's probably two miles away, and we didn't see any pickups or any of the vehicles weren't pulled down off of this bottom. And why would somebody walk two or three miles just to mess around with somebody else, especially at night? Number one, the chance of being shot was, was pretty great. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I would never sneak up on anybody at night. Uh, it's just, you don't do that. But I said, listen, he's getting ready to go. And I said, wait a minute, hang on, Ed. Don't fire up the truck. Let's, think, let's see if this thing, whatever it is, comes in behind this. It was probably about 15, 10, 15 seconds later. And I heard this thing coming up the wood line. And it was busting branches. I mean, I mean, to the point where whatever it was, you could tell it was definitely very, very heavy, very powerful, very strong. Because it was busting branches that set, they sounded like, you know, shotguns going off. And then I thought, okay, what the blank is that? And he looked at me and I said, he was like, I'm done. I'm getting out of here. You know, he basically said, we're in my truck. We're leaving now. And I said, no, whatever it is, I want to see it. I said, if I think I have a feeling what I think it is, I want to see it for myself. And he said, all right. But he said, I have a 357 Magnum Smith & Wesson Model 19 underneath the seat. Go ahead and pull it out. I went ahead and pulled that handgun out. You know, uh, popped the cylinder out. Made sure it had... 357 Magnum hollow points in it, which he did and he carried. He said, go ahead and put that handgun in the center, right in the console. Leave it alone. At least there, we have some satisfaction if, if, if something tries to attack us. Grab the, hun the handgun at that time and go to war. And I said, oh yeah, not a problem. This thing 
come right through the trees, every bit of them, pushed everything up out of the way, and then it stopped right at the wood line, directly right behind the truck. That would have been to the right rear of the pickup back then, if I can recollect. And then I was looking out the passenger side window. At that time, I had slowly, I heard all this commotion coming through. I just went ahead and slowly, you know, they're shutting the door. And he did the same thing on the driver's side. I continued to kind of poke my neck at that time to look outside the passenger side window. And he was looking through the louvers. He had a headache rack. And he was looking through them. This thing literally came out of the wood line directly behind the truck, probably 30 feet behind the pickup where the wood line stopped and then where it came out into a clearing right behind the pickup. This thing had to be every bit of an eight foot tall. I just remember it was like a grayish white color and there was no neck Had the classic cone shaped head, very wide, very wide in the chest, very large. Its hands, its arms were very long and I remember his hands were down by its knees, past its knees. And it just sat there and it swayed just a little bit back and forth. But yet what was very interesting, there was no vocalization. There was no um, aggression. It didn't pick anything up. It didn't throw anything like a lot of them do. But there was no vocalization. But yet I could hear it breathing. And I remember just staring at this. We had a stare off, and it was looking at me. Of course, I was looking up at it, and it was looking down at me. I remember seeing black eyes, but really not enough definition with the moonlight that was available to see, you know, clearly its face. And I remember yelling at it. And I said, what are And, of course, there was no response. And I and then I screamed at it, and then there was no response. And then I said, "If you don't identify yourself, I've got a three fifty seven magnum. I will fire on you." And there was no response. And that's when it scared me, because I thought I just yelled and told whatever this thing is. I've got a Smith and Wesson three fifty seven magnum. I will fire upon you. And it, there was no there was no communication. There wasn't anything. And that's when I looked over to Ed. He looked over at me and said, I've had enough. I said, I agree. He started his pickup. Now, mind you, we still had gear in the back of the truck with the tailgate down. But we didn't, we didn't care at that time, obviously. He fired up the truck. Now, when he fired up the truck, the taillights, of course, the, the headlights and the taillights are obviously going to come on on any vehicle. And then I saw the red reflection from the brake lights light up this creature. And then I could clearly see that it was no man. It was not anybody in a monkey suit. This was a live, living creature. Very large. Every bit, again, of eight foot tall. Probably around five, six hundred pounds. Every bit of that. Every bit of that. And when we were leaving, he was flooring, I mean, literally so scared, he, he, he hit the accelerator all the way to the firewall. The rear, of course, there was all of our stuff just bouncing around all over the place. He had street tires on his pickup or highway tires. And, of course, we were kind of like in a sandy bottom a little bit, so the back end of the truck started hopping. Of course, all of our gears going all over the place. Bowls, big ice chest, common lantern, all that good stuff. So when we started actually taking ground with the, you know, with, with the tires spinning and started grabbing ground, I just, on all this time, all this is going on, I'm still looking at this creature. So one hand, I've got the 357 Magnum, and I'm looking at it, and this thing takes like two leaps. I mean, covers like a r- roughly 30 feet in within seconds. As we're going forward and catching more ground, this thing, when it takes its leaps, 
with the left hand or his left arm, it tries to reach out and grab the tailgate of the truck. And I could, I was looking at this and I was shocked at that point in time. All these, you know, your brain goes at, 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 at warp speed trying to process this information. And I was thinking, what the crap am I looking at? What is this? Is this real? This can't be happening. But yet, I was confused. I'm looking at something that I know that's not supposed to exist. But yet, I've heard stories through Lance's at the time hand me down, you know, books that he would get and I would read them. And I thought, you know, if, if these people are seeing these things, you know, every once in a while, you, you would think that, you know, we would tell more, but we don't. And I know now, being a much older man, why we don't. But at that time, of course, I was probably, oh, I don't know, maybe 21 years old. So I'm 44 years old now, I guess. So, yeah, that was, man, that was a while ago. But, yeah, it was, this thing just literally leaped out covered like 30 feet with, there's no way a man could cover that, that, that 30, 30 feet within seconds. There's no man alive that can do that. So that makes sense for something that's eight foot tall that has to have a stride. It's just, you know, phenomenal to cover ground, to cover the distance from point A to point B within seconds. And it did, but it, it just barely got the tailgate of the truck. And by that time, his pickup, we were already down the service road the, you know, uh, going back out towards the main road. And of course he was flooring it going 90 and nothing. And I had to yell at him to say, Hey, head, slow down. Are you going to kill us? Cause the, the truck was just fish tailing all over that, that, that dirt road. And he finally slowed down and stopped the vehicle. And of course, a lot of dust rolled up behind us. And I looked over at him and he was just as, he was as white as a ghost. I mean, he was white as a paper. And he was just sitting there shaking. And he finally looked at me and said, what the blank was that? And I said, I think we just saw a Bigfoot creature. And of course, this wasn't no dog man creature. This was absolute. The reason why I say that is because I could see that there was no elongated snout. It wasn't, there's no, there was no triangular ears on top of the head like an apex creature. There wasn't, of course, this was obviously bipedal creature as Bigfoots are. But of course, they also have been known to, to run on all fours. So, but at that time, I knew very, very little about Bigfoot. And I knew, and I knew nothing about a dogman creature. So I, I mean, thank God I didn't run in one of those things. But uh, that was a very scary, that was a very confusing um, again, your mind's running at warp speed, trying to process the information. Can't figure it out. Um, so I, man, I tell you what, after all that went down, we, some of that stuff we lost. Never didn't, never did go back. I think we lost the ice cooler, uh, the Coleman lantern. I think we saved, I think we lost a rod, <laughs> uh, never did go back to get that stuff. I tried to, but at that time we were in his truck. So I asked him to turn around because I wanted to go back. And he looked over at me and said, you are crazy. There's no way we're going to go back off in there. We just ran into some type of unknown creature, but yet you want to go back. I said, if we go back, we got headlights. I want to fully identify what this is. I said, I cannot believe these things are real. He said, me either. He said, I, I always thought that they were a campfire story. I said, well, apparently they're not. And he said, no way, Lane. We're going back to town. He said, if you want to come back out here, you're, you know, go for it. You can get in your own, your Jeep, your truck, whatever you got, and come back here and look for it. Well, you know what? I never did. Because, honestly, I was just too nervous. And I thought, you know, I'm not going back off in there by myself, you know, to collect a, a rod or an ice chest. Who cares? Lane, if, if it's okay, so, I, I've got a few questions here. Sure. So normally I would start back at the beginning of the encounter and ask my questions and have you walk back through, but I don't want to kill the moment here because this, I've, I've never heard your encounter and I was not expecting this. This is 
terrifying and amazing. So I, I'm going to do it in backwards order. Whenever you guys got back in the truck and were leaving and it was standing there and you hit the brake brake lights and it illuminated the creature, did you see any eye shine from the brake lights? You know, it, it was, I was so scared and nervous and confused. I did see just a little bit of reflection of, of eye. I, of course, I couldn't identify. There wasn't enough definition to clearly see um, a nose or pupils or nostrils or, or a mouth or teeth. Of course, this thing, again, very shaggy here, very shaggy. It was unkept, of course. It was a dirty, whitish gray color. And it, it was, it, you know, the, 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 we know that there's different shades of colors. And I truly believe that they, 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 when, when seasons change their hair, their hair changes. Um, maybe not true with all of them, but some of them, because, you know, who knows how long have these creatures has been here, you know, and of course they have to follow water sources and food sources to stay alive. Obviously they can't be, you know, centralized in one area and expect to survive for, for God knows how long. But yeah, I never did see, I just saw a little shine. But then again, um, I was so scared at that time and I was confused. I just remember seeing how large it was. I couldn't believe how large this thing was. Yeah. Very, very large and wide and tall. Whenever it jumped, did it jump flat footed and did it jump off of two or four? It jumped off of, it pushed itself on, on like, like say, it, a right leg like what we would, and then it landed on a left leg. So it would push off its right and, and go to a left. It never did, like, push off both uh, 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 feet or legs and then hop to another location. So it just launched itself off of one leg, which I thought at that, now when I look back at it, I, I mean, that's truly amazing. That's a lot of power, a lot of power. A lot of strength to do that, especially covering at least roughly from the tailgate from where it was located from point A to point B. That had to be at least 30 feet. I mean, this was phenomenal power and strength to cover that distance within seconds because I couldn't believe how. And I, I, I saw this thing because when we were going, I looked back and I saw this thing leap forward so fast. And I was like, what in God's name can do that? So it's like it was bounding one foot, the other foot, one yes. foot. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Did you see whenever it got close to the truck and it was reaching out towards the truck, did you see a grimace on its face? Did it, you know, it change its facial expression when it was reaching out for the tailgate? Man, I, I, I honestly don't remember. I just remember I would, because I was, I was seeing a large, a large very long, arm come out but to, you know when i to, to to go back at that and try to remember um looking back it was almost like it was trying very hard like it was there's no there was never any sinister grin or a smile it was more or less like it was trying very hard like what we would as human beings trying to accomplish a task um so you know it was it was trying to you know, basically trying to reach out there, and when I looked at it real quick, I was like, because obviously, and all by by the way, he had a uh, that third brake light, if I remember right, because it was up on top of the cab and it was over the uh, headache rack, so that kind of helped out too back then to see a little bit more definition. But there was more like a, I'm trying to get you, or not, or I'm not necessarily trying to get me, but trying to pull itself it was trying to work real hard to pull itself as the truck kept going forward it was almost there but it wasn't if that makes any sense yeah yeah so uh, let's let's back up then and well first of all as you're driving what ended up happening did it continue to pursue the truck and then just veer off did it stop what what did it end up doing when it gave up the chase well and, and, and again when we were leaving and i saw it reach out and miss like a swipe and just within inches missing the tailgate to pull itself. I, I, I truly believe that it was trying to obviously pull itself into the tailgate or, or, you know, either what else would it could have been, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back 
I, I don't know what else it could have wanted. Unless if it was basically saying, hey, I'm going to pull myself into the back of the bed of the truck so I can reach around and grab one of you, extract you from the vehicle. And, you know, thank God never had, you know, anything crazy ever happened like that. It was crazy enough that we were, I was seeing all this take place, but the dust was boiling so bad that it just, I did, we just lost it or lost it into the, you know, the, 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 the cloud of dust. and. I knew, obviously, when we kept going forward and we finally stopped at the end of the service road, I didn't even think about this. Is it still following me? I, I, I guess in my mind, I was like so fascinated and scared and, and, and mystified that I thought, you know what? Let's just turn around this truck. Now we got to put, this, uh, put the high beams on and I want to go back down that road and I want to see it, the, you know, everything, you know, all the definition. And of course, at that time, Ed was like, you're blanking crazy. We're not going to do this, man. We're going back to town. So, yeah, I mean, I never really thought that it was kept, you know, running after us. I had a feeling that it stopped. It, 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 it veered off and stopped its chase. Uh, it gave up. But we were, by that time, that, was, that service road was probably about a mile from, yeah, so it had been about from the edge of the river to that going down that service road to get back onto the main it was about a mile yeah okay it was a mile section yeah was the beer cooler on the ground and you left it or was it still in the back of the truck no everything was still in the back of the truck like i said when we when we backed up there when we finally backed up he killed the truck where we wanted to face and i went ahead and of course i got out and, and ed at that time he was smoking a cigarette and I got out to, to go to the restroom, and I went ahead and just popped the tailgate open. I knew that, you know, uh, the beer was back there, and I grabbed the long necks, glass bottles, so I grabbed one for me and one for him. He said, hey, Lane, can you grab me one? I said, sure, not a problem. So I grabbed him one, and, of course, the tailgate was still down. All of the gear was still back there, and I was going to fire up that Coleman Lantern, but I said, nah, we'll do this when we're done having a beer. When he's done talking about what happened throughout the day in his pickup, you know, and after he smokes a cigarette, then we'll go back. I'll, you know, we'll finally get out of pickup and we'll fire up the Coleman Lantern and get everything, you know, situated and, you know, and then start catfishing. But, uh, yeah, that was, uh, all that gear was still back there. I'd, I'd never picked up the cooler to, like, you know, manhandle it to put it on the ground. I, I figured if I just left it in the back of the truck while we're sitting on the tailgate, you know, everything was there. I could just turn around and grab a beer or a sandwich, you know, because we did have some food at that time in that cooler. But yeah, everything was back in the bed of the truck still. Okay. Now, obviously, I don't think he would have chased you if he even saw that. But, you know, I was just wondering. I wonder if he was trying to grab that cooler thinking there was food in it because I'm sure they had dealt with other people camping. But who knows? Whenever you were standing there, and this thing comes out of the wood line. You said you started yelling at it and it was swaying. So I'm curious. You said that it was just slightly swaying back and forth. From when it first started doing that to when you started yelling, did the swaying increase? Or did it start to show, you know, that, that it was more uncomfortable or more nervous in any way? Actually, that's a, that's a good question. Um, actually, it stopped. Because I remember when there were, it was swaying enough where it was, there was, we were still close enough, but I, I, I obviously I could see it swaying from left to right. It wasn't, it, it was not any means by the stretch, um, uh, very, it wasn't erratic. It was just a slow, you know, just a sway, just a little sw slight sway left and right. Um, but when I yelled at it and then screamed, it stopped swaying. Still to this day, I often wander. I start doing what? I never heard any vocalization. It never yelled. It never said. It never had any type of. Because I know they have to have communication within their own ranks, within their own species, whatever they are. So they have to have some type of of, of language to communicate with. All creatures do. But there was no um, aggression towards me. Um, it did not have anything in its hand like a rock or a branch or anything to throw at me. It was just, 
I think it was more or less of, of curiosity when it, it, it came up to that, you know, when it came across the field, by the time I laid eyes on it, I thought it go across the wheat field until the time that it hit the wood line and came up behind the truck. I think that this, this creature was, was a more or less trying to investigate it on its own to say, you know, what are you? Well, I'm, I'm sure that it, it has ran into campers and other people out there fishing and, and hunting or, or whatever the case may be, but um, there was no display of, of aggression or, or anything like that. It was, I think it was just more or less kind of coming out there to say, you know, what are you? I'm looking at you. I'm trying to, I'm swaying a little bit, trying to figure you guys out. Kind of like a white tail does sometimes, you know, when you're out hunting or and you see a white tail, uh, you know, whether it's a doe or a buck, you know, how they kind of stomp the ground a little bit and they kind of sway their neck and their head a little bit because they're trying to figure you out. And, you know, once, once they get enough of what they, you know, what they see, and they don't like it, that's when they bolt left or right. So, obviously, this thing didn't bolt left or right. It actually come forward when we were trying to go forward. But, yeah, it, you know, it could have smelled some of that food. And, that you know, I really never thought about that um, all these years later. But that makes, you know, that's a good question. That makes sense. Um, but I, I really don't think it was, it was trying to get me to intentionally hurt me. But, again, what do I know? I mean, it was just, I, I, I can tell you this much. If it would have made its way inside of that that, that uh, truck bed, um, I, I truly think it would have been game on. I think I would have emptied that cylinder right at it. Absolutely. As as I could, because I told him, I mean, there is no way. There's just no way I'm going to let Ethan. Uh, <laughs> when it's eight foot tall and, 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 you know, 500 pounds in the depth of a bat, I mean, it was huge. And I thought, you know what? If 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 I'm going down, I'm going to have a fighting chance. Because if if it's going to try to take me out, I'm going to try to take it out. It, again, this is all at warp speed. This is all this information's processing at you know high speed here. So I'm thinking, what if? What if this? What if that? Absolutely, so, absolutely. Okay, let's let's take it back to the beginning of the encounter here, and real quickly, I've only got I think four or five more questions, so we'll try to get through these, and then we'll move on. Can you explain the landscape a little bit better from where you were parked to where the field laid to where the creek laid, and then the path it came up to you? Can you explain that a little bit better? Well, where we were parked again, we were parked in in it was a Basically, it was it was an old turnaround, and I, I I do recall there there was a 55 gallon barrel there, and God knows how long it's been there. People, you know, I'm sure high school kids at that time or or, or farm kids would come down there and burn crash, and, you know, and park pickups and probably drink beer, listen to music. It just it looked like that, and it you know it was just it was that kind of like it was out in the middle of nowhere. Again, when we backed up. So the pickup would have been, we came in um, from the west heading east. We made a, a horseshoe loop, and we, we we parked the truck where it was facing west. So the tailgate was actually facing uh, the river, the North Canadian River. Of course, I'm on the passenger side of the truck, and to my right of me, when I looked directly to my right, was due north. And it was a huge wheat field. And again... Right behind us was the river, but along the river on both sides was cedar trees, cottonwood, and blackjack trees. And they're all mixed together, of course. Um, very sandy bottom, very sandy. Uh, again, that was in the summertime. It was, a, it was a, uh, a, a moonlit night, a little breezy, not, not bad. There was hardly, I mean, it wasn't like it was really windy or anything like that. But, um, yeah, very, I just remember that the bottom was very sandy. It hadn't rained. And I want to say back at that time, we were going through type of, we were going through a drought. Oklahoma was. So, I mean, my goodness, it, I think the governor at that time had put a burn ban on the state because it was just horrible. It was horrific because we had no water. Um, there was enough water, though, in the river, and meaning that, if you knew where some of the, you know, the, the, the holes where the catfish were at, you know, the deep little holes. And I, and I knew at that time um, what to look for. Now, I, at that time, I had never been there, but we got there at night. And a lot of people were thinking, well, you know, how would you know? Well, 
it's just we Lance and I we we grew up along with Bill, other brother. We grew up uh, hunting, fishing, hiking, camping. We, my goodness, I don't know how many times we went out deer hunting and coyote hunting and uh, catfished throughout the summer and, and the largemouth bass and and uh, mm-hmm. we had just a great time and, and we were around. Um, obviously, our father who who taught us all this stuff and and of course we just carried it on to our families. But at that time there was a there was a burn ban going. I do believe. And it was just very dry that night, um, but again, very sandy. I mean, there was no way that that uh, uh, you, you really you really needed some type of a full hook drive capability. But you know, at that time, we were I was a lot younger guy, and he was too. And we're just we just got off of work, and we're just we're wanting to escape and get away. We, you know, we're we're leaving everything behind, so to speak. You know, in our mind. Okay. So the wheat field was kind of in front of you and to your right, and then the wood line was on your right side and behind you, and the creek was behind you, and the creature came from in front of you to your right, went in the wood line, and they came toward you. Is that correct? Correct, yeah. It, it, when I first laid eyes on this creature, it was coming in from the west, coming across the wheat field to the east, and when it hit the wood line, that's when it worked up at the wood line, which would have been coming back up it would have been going south down the wood line to us. And then that's when it appeared right behind the pickup. Okay. So, yes, that's correct. When it was walking across the field, did you notice any arm swing? Was it dir- walking directly towards you guys or kind of quartered towards you but facing the right? It was, it was, when I looked at it, the best that I could describe this when I first laid eyes on it, is when it was coming across the wheat field, I I was seeing its right side of its body. When all this bipedal movement was going on, I was watching the, the right side of its body. So, um, arms were were out. You could see arm movement. But see, then again, you know, I'm looking at the I'm thinking, what is that? You know, and then when I think about it later on, as you know, as, as throughout time, I remembered what I was looking at is his arms were going back and forth because of the gait it was taking. It was a very fluid-like uh, 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 mechanical movement. And there was no bouncing up and down. Like when a human being, like when we run or jog, we do bounce. It's just how we're, we're, um, we're structured with our, you know, our skeleton. Or with, you know, um, when we jog, we, we, we bounce. But this thing, it didn't bounce at all. It was just very mechanical, uh, almost like ghost-like movement. But I do remember there was a little arm swaying back and forth, and I'm sure it was to keep, help to keep it balanced as it was moving from across that wheat field to the wood line. Okay. That's so common. Uh, we hear that all the time. Their locomotion is just fascinating. But quickly here, I got a couple more, and then we'll move on. Whenever it came up to the edge of the wood line and it stopped, how long was it until it actually stepped out? Probably around 30 seconds. It wasn't long at all. I mean, it was it was probably 30 seconds at least that. Um, it, it wasn't anything like five, five, 10, 15 minutes later, no. I mean, I could hear it literally within the woods, pushing its way up through, and then it stopped once it got to the very edge of the tip of the wood line until it opened up to, you know, right behind the pickup. So, um, about 30 seconds, I mean, it stopped and then roughly around 30 seconds, then it just walked, it just walked out. Like, uh, you would walk out your front door of your house. There wasn't anything where it was trying to you know, be, uh, uh, stealthy like, or, 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 or ninja like or anything like that. I mean, this thing just like walked out like, Hey, I'm here guys. How you doing? Okay. You know, look at me. I, I've got a question about that. Cause I'm very curious because with, With the animal kingdom, posturing is a very, very important detail, and even human beings do it, and we don't even realize it. But when it walked out, did it come straight out and squared up to you the whole time? Did it walk out sideways and stop and turn? How did it walk out when it finally decided to step out in the open and face you? When it walked out, it took about two or three steps 
they were like long strides. They were just normal steps of its own. And then it turned. It squared off. So it came out. I saw the right side of it. And then it turned and faced us. And then it had its legs spread just a little bit, probably equal with its shoulders. And then it was hunched over a little bit. There was a slight, you know, hunch to it or an arc to its back. And then there was a little sway back and forth. But the posture, meaning that as far as the arms, they weren't like up in the air or after the side. They were just hanging normal. They were hanging down. But I remember that the, the arms were so long. And I remember, wow, the hands are past its knees. All right, Lane, I promise. Last question here, and then we're going to bring Lance back on and have him share some stories. But my show being Crypto PTSD, I got to ask this one. After your encounter for the rest of your life, how did this encounter change you? Well, it changed me to the fact that I still go out. You know, I still have the passion and love for the, for the woods uh, to go hunting, which I still do to this day. I, I still go fishing. Um, I still camp, um, obviously, whether it's, you know, with my family or sometimes I, I'll go out. It's probably not as best or wise to do, but sometimes I'll go out, you know, by myself and, and uh, go out to uh, some of the old areas uh, that I had permission to hog hunt on. But also, you know, back then, that was probably the scariest experience I've ever had in my life. But uh, now, up at my age, you know, I was overseas. I was over there with uh, the military. And so, you know, having a couple of tours in Iraq and then uh, 15 months, you know, or two in Afghanistan, 15 months later, you know, in two combat war zones there, that, that takes the cake with me. So I am not, I have a total respect for life, meaning that back then when I was a young man, the respect was there. But I, I, I was still naive enough. You know, I was still just a kid. So I was looking at something that was, you know, basically it was my alien. It was something that just came out of a UFO to me. And I, and, and I was scared. But I'm not, even to this day, when I go out, and it's best always to go out with a, a friend. You know, overseas we could call it a battle buddy. Wherever you went, you had one. You had to. That was, that was, that was, that was your MO. That was SOP. You had to have that. But... When I go out into the, the forest today or the woods, um, I'm always looking around. Of course, I have a 1,000% respect for, for, for nature or the wild kingdom, but I know they exist and I know they're there. Tonight, I'd like to welcome Luke onto the show. Luke, thanks for coming on, man. Hey, thanks for having me. Luke, why don't you tell us a little bit about where you're from and you can be as specific or as vague as you want to be. Well, I was born and raised in the Pacific Northwest in Washington State, Vancouver to be exact. Pretty much crossed the river numerous times over to the Oregon side. And I'm uh, born and raised in the Northwest, and it's kind of where my heart is, even though I'm across the world right now. But my heart's always in Washington State. Why don't you tell everybody what you're doing now? Because I, I think we've been talking for about 20 minutes. I find it real interesting what you're doing. I think it's every little boy's dream to do something uh, like what you're doing. But why don't you tell everyone what you're, what you're doing right now? These days, I'm an American serving in the French Foreign Legion. I'm here in France. Enlisted when I was 34, and I'm 37 years old right now. I'm in the uh, First Reg, which is a uh, combat engineering company in Lodon, France. I uh, pass a lot of my time blowing up all kinds of things with 250 grams of petard or explosives. Anything larger than that, I usually spend my time blowing things up and perfecting the art of destruction in a controlled environment, of course. Uh, that's so awesome, man. I think it's Jean-Claude Van Damme every time I think <laughs> of the French Foreign Legion. Yeah, I don't know about I don't know about you, but yeah, I, 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 I don't know if I get a handle Jean-Claude Van Damme personally, but... Uh, I uh, like the analogy. All right, Luke, tell us a little bit about what you knew about the subject of Bigfoot, Dogman, or just the unknown as you were growing up as a child in the States. Well, definitely Dogman. I, Dogman is relatively new to me. And I, I said relatively new as in like five years for me personally. Sasquatch, Sasquatch is something I've always grown up like hearing about, knowing about hearing stories about, you know, because I'm, I, I'm from the Pacific Northwest and Washington State, and Sasquatch is just as common 
as as a grizzly bear would be in Alaska. You know, I mean, Sasquatch is so common in Washington State that on you know most of the mass transportations and buses and things, there's big Sasquatch logos as bank marquees there's all kinds of things there's even uh, coffee shops with sasquatch themes so sasquatch is it's everywhere it's just like a pet dog there it's, you say sasquatch people are just like oh yeah the sasquatch you know it's, it's nothing out of the ordinary i've always known about sasquatch and anytime i would hear something or you know be a little news clip in a you know some magazine or something i i was never one to be like oh it's just a bunch of malarkey it was always like, oh, well, this is it. They, they finally got something. They got a better picture. They got a better video. They've got DNA now. They've got something. This is it. Finally, everybody can just calm down and finally accept that it's just really reality and nobody's crazy, but everybody who thought that it was crazy. So, yeah, for me, Bigfoot was just an everyday occurrence. What about in France? Have you heard any stories or talked to any guys in the French Foreign Legion? You know, those guys are from all around the world. Have you heard any stories about anything unknown from any of those guys? Um, you know, personally, I I haven't because bear in mind, I, I'm sure somebody's got a story somewhere. However, the the problem is it is the French Foreign Legion, so we have a lot of guys that you know speak Ukrainian, speak Russian, speak Mongolian, speak Nepalese, but also speak French as well. So kind of getting on the topic of, of a Sasquatch or a dog man or the Loch Ness Monster or e- anything for that matter is probably the last thing on anybody's mind being a professional soldier. But I personally have not. But what I can say is in me listening to your show and other shows and having a couple of my buddies like that listen to the show also, they had never heard anything about a dog man or a Sasquatch before I mentioned it. And now they're essentially as obsessed with it because they listen to it as well. And they have a strong desire to get out there and and find a hunt or, you know, trap or whatever, a Sasquatch or a dog man, because they're absolutely fascinated by it. And it's just mind perplexing to them how they've never heard anything like that before. So for those guys now, there's a couple of them that uh, definitely know about dog man and, and Sasquatch. But for the rest of the guys in the Legion, I I really can't say. But it's absolutely guaranteed that somebody from Ukraine or Russia or Siberia, for that matter, has probably got a story in this somewhere. Maybe even the Himalayas. You know, I'm not entirely sure. What about the people in France? Is it a running joke or is it kind of taken more serious? No, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it would be a running joke at all. I would say Dogman, Dogman is, or, you know, a, a werewolf uh, here. The, the French are very much aware of things of that nature, especially werewolves. So I don't know if, if the, the French are particularly um, versed in Dogman. But werewolf, definitively, the the French are very, very in tune with centuries-old stories of werewolves. Because werewolves in France are what Dogman is in the U.S. So they're probably one and the same, except they're actually just calling a werewolf a werewolf here, whereas people are calling a deer dog or a wolf man or a dog man or something like that in the U.S. So... I would say it's it's identically the same, just with a different terminology. All right, Luke. Well, let's go ahead and get started with your encounters tonight. Start from the beginning, take us all the way through, and as you're telling it, try to explain the landscape as best as possible in order to paint a picture in our listeners' minds. I know you have multiple encounters, so I'll let you get through each one, and then I'll stop you. We'll go back, and I'll ask you questions, and then we'll move on. But Luke, go ahead and take it away tonight, man. All right. I had just gotten out of the service. It was 2007. It was early October. I had a pocket full of money. I didn't have anything to do. I wanted a 180 kind of in my life. And, you know, I grew up in the Northwest. So Oregon was always a place I wanted to live, but never had lived. So what I ended up doing is I just jumped on Craigslist looking for a place to kind of just uh, recalibrate, and decompress my life out of uh, getting out of the service in the, in the U.S., and I ended up finding a really cool place on Craigslist, way out in Estacada, Oregon. I had never even heard of Estacada. 
I, I map quested it and I looked on Google Earth and it looked really interesting because it was way out in the middle of nowhere in, in the forest and the mountains. So I uh, went ahead and gave the lady a call who placed the ad and she said, yeah, come on out. I've had this room out in my garage. It wasn't a room. It was just like a big giant pole barn converted into a, into like an apartment. I went out there and I checked it out and we negotiated the price, the utilities and whatnot. And, and I could see why nobody had even bit on the advertisement or went out there because it was out in the middle of nowhere. And if you didn't have a job or a vehicle or something, there really wasn't any reason for you to be out there. So I ended up taking the place and I got way out in the middle of nowhere. And fortunately at that time, I, you know, I just got out of service and I was unemployed, but I had quite a few bucks saved up, you know, so I wasn't really worried about anything, you know, my whole intention was to go out there and just reevaluate my life on what to do next after getting out of service. So what ended up happening is, yeah, I lived out there for a couple of weeks, ended up meeting this, this woman's son, his name was Chris, and uh, he had a construction company and he was building stuff all over the place. He was like the local contractor of uh, Estacada out there. And ended up meeting him and we talked and shot the breeze and all that. He was mentioning that he was going to be building this little house, this little house way, way, way up at the top of the mountain on a little road called Sutter Creek Lane. So if you look on like Google Earth or something and you see Sutter Creek Lane, you'll definitely understand like how far out in the middle of absolute nowhere this place was. So I started talking and I was letting him know, you know, okay, you know, I can sheet rock and I can do this and that and I can frame and and I offered to just help the guy out. I was like, well, you know, I got nothing going on. I have 24 hours every single day and I don't do anything at all, all day because I'm unemployed and I just got the service and I'm just reevaluating my life right now. So he uh, took me up to this place and showed me this big area where they had already built like this, uh, I think it was a 12 by 12 or 12 by 20 or I'm not entirely sure. It was something like that, 12 by 12 or 12 by 20 little little tiny house next to a, a buddy at his house, maybe 50 yards away. And they were building it because his buddy's wife's dad was getting getting to that age where, you know, they didn't want to put him in hospice or anything. And he didn't want to go. He was just a diehard. He grew up out in the sticks his whole life. So the last thing the guy wants to do is go out in hospice. So they were going to build him a little, a little house right next to their house. So they keep an eye on him. He keep his dignity and he can do his own thing on his own terms, not have any problems. So we're uh, up there and we've been working on this place. The place, it was right next to a little stream. And I say little, but it wasn't entirely little. It's maybe six, eight feet wide and two or three feet deep. And it moved pretty quick, you know, because it was way up on the mountain. And, and anytime it rained, you know, all the runoff would go into this creek and it would flood this little creek. So. The house that they built, they had to put it on stilts. So they, they built this foundation with a bunch of stilts, and it was maybe 10 or 15 feet away from this creek. And they, they were building it on stilts because in flood, it would naturally it would flood, and it would flood the entire area, and it would look like a little lake out there. But you would never know how deep it was if you'd never been out there before. So if you you're a first time uh, guy seeing the place, you'd be like, wow, it's a big old place. But in reality, it's just a flooded out creek. The area around there was always wet, damp, and you know, full of rain all the time. So had to put all these stilts underneath for the, for the framework of, of this little house. And as like the weather would have it, it was really hard to work out there because it was always flooding all the time. So how we'd actually have to get out like to this little job site, we'd had this little Komatsu, little tractor thing, little backhoe on the Komatsu. We'd have to just drive through this like flooded out place that had already been established and then start working on this little cabin. When I got out there, the whole thing was already, it was already constructed. All the, all the framework was already done on it. The, the tin roof was on it. And uh, the the walls, all the walls on the outside, it was all T111. So anybody who's built anything knows what T111 is. All the walls are T111. They had all the doors, except the door wasn't a door. It was just a, uh, a sliding glass door. And then there was a back door, which was a door that didn't have a doorknob or anything on it yet. 
there was no sheetrock or anything. It was just a skeleton with the, the T-111. And we've been, you know, hammering away and doing a bunch of crap on the inside, so just tidy up kind of stuff. As the day wore out, my new buddy, Chris, who was the contractor, he was going to, you know, he was going to leave for the day and uh, head home and call it a wraps. Me, I decided, you know, I was just going to, I was just going to stay out there. I said, no sense of me going down the mountain. I'm going to be back up here in like seven or eight hours anyway. So I'm just going to crash out here in this little, little tiny uh, house that we've all, well, I didn't make much of it because it was already there. So what ended up happening is Chris, he took off and he went down the mountain to his family. His buddy Heath, that lives you know right over 50 yards away, gave me a sleeping bag and was like, yeah, here you go. Do this, this, and this. We'll see you in the morning, have breakfast and whatever and start working. And he also had left me with an SKS, you know, because there's, you know, cougars and all kinds of crap out there. And naturally it's just, you know, home defense. So I had an I had an SKS. It was actually one of those old uh, M59 Type 66 Yugos. So I had a, a, a Yugo SKS. I didn't have any mags for it. It was just a stripper clip, so it was ten rounds in the thing. But still, you shoot anything ten times with seven six two by three nine uh, FMJs at that, you're going to put some holes in soles. So I was I bed down for the night. I'm laying on the floor, and the floor is on the foot off the ground because this place is on stilts i just you know i go to sleep and it, it's pouring down rain and and for me the rain is like a really soothing thing because i grew up in the northwest and here in rain it's just like it's just background noise and it sounds soothing so i'm asleep i'm in the sleeping bag i have this sks next to me I before I went to bed, I, I put up like a blanket, or it wasn't a blanket. It was one of those when you're doing sheetrocking and all the spackling, one of those like uh, tarp things you put on the floor so you don't get all that crap everywhere, and you're doing the spackling. Anyway, I hung that up over the the window in this one room. So to explain this little house, it, like I said, it was either twelve by twelve or twelve by twenty. It was very very small. It had one little bedroom, and that was in the uh, southwest corner. Bear in mind, uh, Heath's, Heath's place would have been to the, the northeast. So I'm in the south, the southwest corner. To the left of that little tiny bathroom, it had not an, uh, enough room to sit down, get the job done, and that was about it. And then in front, it was a little open area, you know, with a little kitchen connected to the living room. Everything was like all in one. And that's where the sliding, the sliding glass door was. So that will just kind of give people a, an idea of, the, uh, the environment inside of this little house. So I'm asleep in the middle of the night. Oh, and bear in mind, in, in, in this room where I'm asleep is the back door, the door that doesn't have the doorknob. The door frame is there. The door is attached. The door is actually shut as well, but there's no doorknob attached. And it's also a foot off the ground because it's on stilts and it didn't have any stairs. So you'd have to climb up a foot and a half or jump down a foot and a half to get in or out of the place anyway. And that goes for the sliding glass door as well. So I'm asleep and I don't, I don't even know what time it was that I woke up, but when I did wake up, first of all, I was, I was laying on my stomach and I had um, my head turned to the right. So that would put my left ear directly on the floor and I wake up and I'm he I hear all these dogs. I hear these like dogs barking and I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, where are these dogs coming from and why are they barking in the middle of the night and which direction are they? So I'm still listening and they're directly behind me. So if I'm in the Southwest, then that definitely means they're completely South of me. So I'm listening to these dogs and I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out like why there's dogs barking in the middle of the night because I'm in the middle of absolute nowhere. And seeing another house out there, yeah, I mean, I have no idea how far away another house would be in any direction because, it, for one, it wasn't even really geographically oriented to begin with. But I still knew I was in the middle of BFE. So I'm listening to these dogs. And as I'm listening, uh, it, the dogs, like, it's getting louder and louder. This, it sounds like a little mini pack of dogs barking. And as I'm hearing these dogs bark, Laying on the floor, I start feeling the, the entire house. I start feeling these vibrations, like on the ground. And then the, it's it's 
like increasing and increasing and the dog's barking like it's getting louder and louder as these vibrations are getting like more and more intense. And then it dawned on me that the vibrations were bipedal one after another, dun, 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 dun. And it was, it was coming down this hill that was directly behind this little cabin. And at that time, when I, when I, I registered in my mind that it was, it was two, only two legs. It wasn't four. It wasn't, it wasn't a giraffe. It wasn't a, a bear. It wasn't anything like that. I had already made up in my mind. I was like, holy, this is, it's a Sasquatch. So like my mind had already told me like exactly through reason and logic of what this was. And I can just, the vibrations just got bigger and bigger and bigger until the whole place is shaking. And I can feel everything through the floor because I'm laying on the floor and my ear is right to the ground and these massive shakes at, from the, the legs of this thing running down the hill. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, Oh my God. Like I know what this is. And it's coming right at me. I, I thought it was going to come right through the back of this, this shelter, this house that we had built. And then all of a sudden, immediately, it just stops. And all the dogs, they just stopped barking. There was no sounds of dogs. And, and I'm listening. And I, I'm absolutely paralyzed in fear. I, I, I can absolutely admit I was scared because I didn't hear anything else. I didn't hear the dogs barking and I couldn't figure out what was going on. But after a minute or two, like to the right of me where my face is now pointing because it's always been that way to begin with and my ear is still on the ground. I, and I'm maybe, I might, I might be three inches away from the T-111 from the wall. And I hear, I hear something just like rubbing up against the wall. And it, it sound it, it sounded like, if you took your, uh, like, let's say you have a Gore-Tex jacket or some jacket that makes just a bunch of scratchy, staticky noise, it, it sounded to me like the shoulder or an entire body was just walking slowly back and forth outside of the uh, uh, of the house, and I'm just thinking, oh, d-, because the uh, this glass door was like cracked by maybe six or seven inches, and I'm thinking, I'm like. This thing is going to come inside of this this house, and I was already I was already preparing in my mind what I was going to do because I, I knew I knew it was outside and I could hear it, and it was it was really really scary, and so what I was doing as that was happening is I was slowly inching the sleeping bag over the top of my head while I was inside of it, and my strategy what I had already told myself was if this thing comes inside, I'm just going to lay here and play dead, not even move and hope that it doesn't, doesn't catch wind of me. Or even if it does, it doesn't know where I am because it can't see me and I'm not going to move and I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to lay here. Even though I got this SKS right next to me, I, I, I there was no way in hell I was even going to think about going that route. That was just, it wasn't optional to me. So I'm, I'm laying there. And I'm thinking, oh man, you know, what, what on earth is going to happen? And so I'm listening to this thing, not this thing, it, it, it was definitively a Sasquatch. And I'm listening to it like walking back and forth. And I don't know how long it had been doing that. And I was wondering, I'm like, what is it doing? And why is it outside here? And why did it stop? And why are all these other dogs, wherever they were, which was to the south, whatever they're doing now, why are they not barking anymore? And, and what are they doing? Did they leave? Are they still there? What's happening? And all of these things are going through my mind and I can hear this thing just moving around outside and it's pouring down rain. And so I can hear like all these like sloshing, like feet smashing in mud, just like if you're a kid wearing rubber boots and you're stomping in a mud puddle, it sounded like that. It sounded like this thing was just going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And I didn't, I didn't see it at all. I didn't, I didn't smell anything I, I, or nothing like that. Cause I can only imagine even if, if there was a major odor to the Sasquatch, there was, it was probably muffled by the rain because this rain was uh, just a deluge. It was a downpour. 
So eventually what ended up happening was that I just, I, I laid there and I listened to it and I was just imagining, I'm like, how tall is it? How big is it? Because if I can feel these vibrations when it was running down this hill, if I could feel the vibrations and it was shaking the entire this house, the thing had to be, I mean, you'd have to be stupid to say it wasn't at least 700 pounds. I mean, to make an entire house shake like that, you have to have a substantial weight. Hearing this thing out there for hours, I, at some point in time, I, I fell back asleep. And then as biology would have it, I woke up the next morning and the first thing, you know, I, I spring awake and immediately I'm like, oh, oh crap. It all came back immediately. Like, is that Sasquatch still outside? But at this point it was already daylight. I knew it was daylight because all the daylight was coming through and to the glass door in front and, and through the back door where the doorknob was supposed to be, all the light was coming through that. So I knew I was safe. Well, yeah, I guess I was safe. That's what was, was going through my mind. And so I, I got out of the sleeping bag. And at that point, then I grabbed the SKS. So I peek my head around the corner. I look out the sliding glass door and it's still, it's still cracked six or seven inches. It didn't move at all. So that tells me that the Sasquatch didn't even mess with the door or the sliding glass door at all. But what I could see on all of the glass because at night, you know, it's really, really cold outside. It's, it gets all foggy, you know, on the inside and the outside. But it looked like like a car wash on the outside. Like where this thing was going back and forth where its fur or hair was, was rubbing against it. The whole, entire, the whole entire window was, you could see these big smears of where you knew it was hair because it was all wavy. And, and you know, there was like mud and dirt or whatever might have been on this thing like smeared all over uh, on the side of the glass so i open it and i run out and i look on the ground and there's there had i don't know how many footprints but there were footprints overlapping footprints there was just footprints everywhere where this thing was just wandering around and these things were gargantuan massively gigantic i didn't measure them I didn't, I didn't think about doing any of that because I already knew what my eyeballs were seeing. I already knew that these things had to have been 16, 18 inches off the top. That's, that's minimal, I'm thinking. Maybe even larger. I really don't know. But I guarantee you there was nothing smaller than 16 inches. That's an absolute. So I'm looking at all these footprints and I'm just like, geez, what was this thing doing? And then uh, I just I ended up looking underneath the uh, under under the house and under the house was this dog underneath the house and i'm like what is this dog doing this has to be one of those dogs from last night and i didn't know where the dog even came from for one but the dog it, it was a bird dog they had this really awesome like camo coat to it gray and had spots all over but here's this dog underneath this cabin and i'm thinking holy crap Okay. And so I'm starting to put all of these things together in my mind. And what, what my mind was telling me is this dog was either a running away from the Sasquatch or B was chasing the Sasquatch. But I, I, I don't think he was chasing. I think this dog was running away from the Sasquatch. I think at some point in time, this Sasquatch found this dog or dogs somewhere wherever these dogs came from and either one of these dogs just took off running for its life and its buddies saw the Sasquatch chasing its buddy and they just followed suit or the, the, the dog had just been chasing the Sasquatch and just happened to go underneath this, this house. But I don't think so. So what also occurs to me is why all of these footprints are out outside everywhere. So what I'm thinking happened is this, this dog got chased by the Sasquatch, ran for its life, and by grace, found this house where I happened to be in, ran underneath this house and hid for all of its life and all of its worth. And that Sasquatch was outside, pacing, wandering around, scratching his head, trying to figure out how we can get this dog underneath this house, because it's only maybe a foot a foot and a half maximum. And uh, the last I checked, um, all Sasquatches are 
seven, eight feet, and let's just say a minimal of 500 pounds, how is that thing going to get underneath the house to grab a dog? So in my mind, I'm thinking that's what happened. If I could reconstruct like what actually happened, that that dog was running for its life, got underneath this house. I happened to be in it, but at the same time, I didn't even know this dog was underneath this house this entire time. The Sasquatch was outside of the house, wandering around, trying to figure out how to get this dog. So to me, it's just logic that that explains all of these footprints were just everywhere because I think the Sasquatch was trying to mastermind or devise some kind of idea on how the to get this dog that's underneath the house because he's got a meal right there, you know? All right, Luke, I've got a couple questions here for you, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Did you tell the guy that was living in the house next door what happened and show him the prints? When those guys came over, they looked at me and asked me to say, what the hell happened here? And I said, man, you, you wouldn't believe it if I told you, man. But I mean, clearly, yeah, they, they all saw him and they, they all, you know, really registered like, holy crap, there's a, there was a Sasquatch here. At that time, I told him like, hey, look, there's a dog underneath this house. And we tried, I tried for hours and hours. I mean, that dog ate like a champion. I mean, that dog was at like a buffet because that dog ate pork chops and steaks and all kinds of things, trying to coax that dog out of there. And finally it came out and I kept him best dog I ever had in my life. But yeah, they, they really wondered what the hell happened. And I, I told them the whole story and there, there was no way to, to say no, it didn't happen after seeing all these footprints all over the place. How much progress had you made on the building that day? Like, you didn't, like, erect it and put a roof on it that day, did you? No, no, not at all. This thing was already erected. It was already framed. The only work that I did, I was, I put all the blocking in between all the framing. Because we all know when you frame a house, you got to go 16 inches in between the blocking because it's a two by fours. So you got to have an additional two inches. So I, I put in all the blocking in between the two by fours, but, but that was all that I did. This thing was already really constructed. I, I didn't do anything. The sheetrock and everything was already inside the house. It just needed to be put up. Okay. The reason I, I was asking, because as you were telling this before you saw the dog or mentioned the dog, I was thinking maybe mm-hmm. this thing was keeping tabs on how far, or how much progress you guys were making, but it seems to think that this dog was definitely had its attention. But when it comes to the marks on the side of the house, how tall mm-hmm. did they go up? So where can you guess its shoulder may have been? If I had to take a guess, because the door in itself, I'm five foot seven. So I'm imagining the door was maybe six and a half feet tall. Maybe seven maximum. But then again, it was a, a foot, a foot and a half off of the ground. But where it would appear that the shoulder would stop was nearly, nearly to the top, nearly to the top of the, uh, of this glass window. And then from there, it was only maybe, maybe another foot, a foot and a half before you hit the roof line. So I would put that at eight feet. That's where I would put it at. It could be a little more. It could be a little less. But even if it is, it's not a little more or a little less by more than five inches, I would say. How deep were the footprints in the mud? Oh, these things were, some of them were, I mean, some were maybe four or five, maybe even six inches deep. And the reason I say that is because it was pouring down rain and the ground was just saturated. It was goo. It was mud. It was liquefied ground. So some parts, obviously, were going to be a little bit deeper than others. But the average, I would say two and a half, three inches, that was just an average one because the the ground was so soft. Do you think these guys had previous knowledge of this creature being in the area? Or do you think this was the first time they had actually seen evidence of it? I seem to think that these guys had a pretty good idea that this, this wasn't just a, a random occurrence. I think, in my opinion, without saying anything on fact, I think for sure that these guys had had either some kind of encounter or, or definitively have seen or something in this area. You know, because these guys, these, 
dudes have lived out there their entire lives. They're hunters, they're fishers. They've seen it all. They've done it all. And just by their uh, body language and by the way they express themselves and they seem, you know, it was almost, it was almost kind of like they, they, they already knew, but they tried to play it off as a, as a joke, you know, kind of a, what the hell happened here kind of thing, you know, where they already know, but they're just trying to play it off like, geez, wow, this is a, this is strange. Mind uh, telling us what happened here, bud? What color was the outside of the house? Well, the outside, it, was, it wasn't any particular color because the T-111 was just primer on the outside. So it was like that weird gray, like color of primer, you know, before you put the, uh, your first coat of paint on. So it was all gr- like that weird gray, dreary gray color because it was just T111 and it just had the primer on, on the T111. Okay. Last question here. Whenever you said that you could feel it walking down the hill, could you also feel it oh, when yeah. it was pacing outside? You know, I, 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 the vibrations, no, they weren't like they were when, when it was definitively running. When it was running, if I, if I had a glass of water or soda or something that was like on the floor, I guarantee you that water or whatever liquid was inside that thing would be splashing out of a, a cup. That, that's how, how intense these vibrations were. I mean, these things were, I don't know what an earthquake's like. Never been in one, but I've seen a lot of simulations on some pretty nasty earthquakes. And I'm fairly confident that I could say that this was probably like a 7.0 earthquake coming down the hill. I mean, it was enough for me to feel the vibrations coming through the floor and having my head on the floor with my left ear to the floor. I absorbed all of it. You know, I, I could feel it. It was something else. I've never felt anything like that before. And that's how I knew it was a Sasquatch. It, only common sense says something like that. You know, nobody's going to say, oh, gee, yeah, it's, a, it's a bear. You know, there's only little black bears. And we all know black bears are not that big. Okay, I fib to you. One last question. Whenever the dogs were sure. barking, were they getting mm-hmm. closer and closer? Or were they already on the property when you heard them? Yeah, see, that's what it was. They were not on the property. They were coming from somewhere else. So when I was hearing these dogs bark and it was getting louder and louder, it's because they were coming down the hill. They were coming down this hill chasing. I think they were chasing the Sasquatch and they was getting louder and louder. And I think the reason why the dogs stopped barking is because the Sasquatch immediately stopped right behind the house. And I think the reason why the Sasquatch stopped is because, as my theory goes, it was chasing this other dog, and the dog ran underneath the house, and so the Sasquatch stopped because it knew the dog was under the house. And so the other dogs that were that were up there, they just put the brakes on and said, oh, it stopped. What are we going to do now? And so I think they just either tucktailed and, and ran or just stayed quiet and uh, didn't do anything at all. I really don't know, but that's that's my theory. All right, Luke. Well, let's go ahead and move on to your next encounter. The next encounter, it, it was on this property. It was still here building this house. Things are progressing at this point. And bear in mind, this is probably maybe maybe two weeks later, you know, because we were we were finishing up the sheetrock. All the sheetrock was done. All the spackle was done. And uh, at that point, we were digging a... Uh, a septic tank. We put a little floating septic tank right behind, right behind this little house with the Komatsu tractor that we had. And at that point, I, I had this dog. I had this dog now because the dog uh, that I found was was chased by a Sasquatch underneath underneath his house. I didn't think anything of it. You know, I didn't think that anything else had ever happened. So me, instead of going home down the mountain to my place, I, I would just end up staying in this house with this dog now that I have now come to adopt because it's a genuine orphan Sasquatch survivor by this point. So this dog, I, I originally had him outside, but I ended up thinking, I'm like, geez, that just seems like a real bad idea. You know, considering where this dog came from, considering how I got this dog, I, sh- I should probably just keep the dog inside. Bear in mind, this sliding glass door is still there. I would keep the dog in inside the house. He had his food bowl, he had his water bowl, and it was inside, it was right next to the sliding glass door. And I kept the door open on the sliding glass door 
just wide enough for the dog to jump in and out. So, you know, in the middle of the night or whatever, if he needs to handle his business, he'll just go and jump out this door and then jump right back in it. So, again, this is like two weeks later after after I found the dog and after the first time I had the experience out seeing, seeing the Sasquatch. Well, I had all this dog food and I had a, a, a big rubber made garbage can, had all the dog food inside this rubber made garbage can, had the lid on it and everything. And I just had it outside, right outside the, the sliding glass door, just sitting there, had a lid on it. It's not going to get wet. Nothing's going to happen to it. You know, once again, I'm sleeping. I'm in my sleeping bag. The dog's in the house. I wake up and this time, you know, I'm not, I'm not waking up down first quick coming down the mountain. But the dog is right, like right next to me. And this is unusual for the dog, you know, because he had his own little bed and everything out. This huge giant, well, it wasn't huge, but in his own little room. I wake up and here's this dog just like laying on me. And I'm thinking, like, geez, well, that's the first time. Okay, cool. But then, you know, I kind of realized that like the dog, he's just like looking in the direction of where the sliding glass door is. I'm like, what are, you, what are you looking at? Maybe, maybe there's a cougar. Maybe there's a raccoon. Maybe there's something. And then I hear the lid, the rubber made lid on the garbage can. I hear it like pop. It sounded like a pop because if, you, uh, if you've seen those big rubber made garbage cans, they kind of got like a, a well, it looked like a half circle top. And since the rubber, you can push down on them and then they'll come back and they'll pop back up. Well, I heard the, I heard the lid on this garbage can pop, and I'm thinking like, "Geez, what is that? Maybe maybe there's an animal trying to get in into the uh, to the dog food." And so at this point, like I didn't think anything of the Sasquatch or anything. I do I do get up and I kind of you know I do the little the look around the wall thing so you can look out the sliding glass door, and I don't clearly see what is entirely outside because it's so dark you know there's no lights out there there's no nothing there wasn't moonlight there wasn't anything there's just you trying to adapt your eyes to the darkness and you know you squint and you think you see something but you're not really sure but i'm i'm looking and i'm straining my eyes and i i feel like I can make out something, but I, I'm not really sure. And so kind of inch my way a little bit closer to the sliding glass door because I'm, I'm convinced. I'm like, there's definitely an animal eating the dog food. That, that's for sure. So as I get a little closer to the sliding glass door, I'm looking and and then I can I can definitively see that there is something right there, right outside the sliding glass door in inside the dog food but what what it looked like to me it looked like there was a big old arm inside the dog food and the reason why is because i I think it broke it broke its arm through the top of the lid and since it's rubber made and it was rubber it stuck to the arm because the lid was on there it was on there's one of those those rubbers where you snap it if you twist it it locks into place. And the only way you're getting it off is if you turn it the opposite direction so it comes undone, and then you take the lid off. Well, that's what it was with this with this garbage can lid. And so this had to have been a Sasquatch for sure, but I can't 100% say with Sasquatch, but I'm pretty sure it's Sasquatch. It had broke its arm through the top of the Rubbermaid lid and had put its arm inside the dog food garbage can but it couldn't get its arm, well, it could, but it couldn't get the lid off because it was already snapped on. So at that point, I, I'm seeing this Sasquatch it, taking this dog food out of this dog, the, 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 the garbage can. And I don't know if it was scent or anything like that, but something, it, it had to have been me. And maybe I breathed loud or something like that, spooked the Sasquatch. And... It, this thing, it took off. It just bolted. And then now that we're getting back to the, the sounds of the first time, to all these vibrations, it was the same thing with all the vibrations. Like once this thing took off, vibrations, like you, you just felt it. But when this thing took off, it had the garbage can still attached to its freaking arm because the lid didn't unscrew and it didn't pull its hand out. It just took off. And I had a 25-pound bag of dog food inside this, this garbage can. 
completely full. The whole, not the whole garbage can, but the whole bag of dog food was inside this garbage can. And it took off and ran for, I don't know how far it ran or where it ran, just ran far enough to where I didn't feel the vibrations anymore or hear the vibrations or anything like that. But it took off with the whole garbage can and the dog food and just bolted. That right there, after after that thing happened, I just kind of quit because for, for starters, I wasn't getting paid to do anything. I was just out there to help this guy. I had nothing to do. I, I wasn't employed by him. I was just trying to be a nice guy, help the guy out past time because I wasn't doing anything. But when the garbage can took off with the, uh, this Sasquatch in the middle of the night, I went back down to the mountain. I stayed there with the dog and I did my thing and I, di- I didn't go back up to the mountain anymore. And, and that was that. I know some stories are way cooler, you know, or there's a lot more detail or people see things. And, but I didn't, I couldn't see with clarity 100%. But I know bears or cougars don't run off with garbage cans full of dog food. It reminds me a lot of a coon trap that they used to use back in the day. And of course, this coon trap's very cruel. uh, And I don't agree with the use of this coon trap. However, what they used to do is they'd put something shiny or something bright in a small little hole. Just enough where a coon Uh, could get in. And what it would do is it would reach in and grab it. And as it would pull out, it would have nails or shards or something that would lock into right. its its forearm or its hand. It couldn't get it out. And if it right. would have just let go, it could have gotten its hand out. But they don't. They hold on to whatever they're grabbing. And so it's kind of the same thing. Like instead of letting go of the dog food, or maybe it right. couldn't. Maybe it was really stuck on there. It just took off running. That That's pretty funny. Did you see the trash can when you left the next day? Nope, not a trace of the trash can, not a trace of the lid, not, not even the dog food. The whole assembly was just gone. It it was gone. The whole thing. I don't know, yeah, if it just didn't want to let go or if it was in fact stuck. All right, Mark, I know you've had several encounters tonight, so I'm going to hand it off to you here in a minute. And when I do, I just want you to start from the beginning, take us all the way through. When you're telling the encounter, try to explain the landscape as best as possible in order to paint a picture in our listeners' minds. I'll let you get through each one, and then I'll stop you, and we'll briefly go back, and I'll ask you a few questions, and then we'll move on to the next. But Mark, go ahead and take it away tonight. Like I said, I grew up in Southern California. It's kind of a beach bum. Never really spent any time in the woods. I went into the Navy, and now I'm retired Navy. I retired here in Washington, uh, married, two kids. My kids are grown, and they're on their own now. But uh, So I'd never been hunting, and uh, a guy I worked with at the time uh, was an avid hunter, grew up in Oregon, uh, spent his whole life in the woods. Labor Day weekend 2015, he wanted to scout hunting areas in the North Cascades, east of where I live for hunting season that was coming up and uh, we're going to overnight on sunday labor day weekend of 2015 out there and our plan was to uh go off this valley uh it's a valley real steep uh, mountainsides a lot of creeks and streams heavily wooded there's a river that runs through the valley and there's logging roads that go back miles and miles back into these hills and nobody's back there nobody lives back there in the valley there's just very little human 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 contact back there. So uh, we got out there early morning on on a Sunday, and our plan we did our plan. We find uh, drive these logging roads, find game trails, get out and walk these game trails. And uh, I, you know, we were worried about mountain lions and black bears. So uh, I, I did bring a couple firearms. I had a 44 mag on my hip, and then I had an AR-15 just in case. There's a lot of mountain lion attacks up here in Washington, and. Uh, so uh, that was our that was our major concern. So we'd been out there all day. We came to a dead end. Uh, we were driving and we came to a dead end of a logging road. Uh, it looked like old oh, like logging trucks that used to turn around there or something. It was kind of this large area. We decided to take a break. I remember it was, it was around two forty in the afternoon on Sunday, and uh, so we parked a truck. And I just grabbed a bottle of water and he grabbed something to eat. And there was these boulders on the other side of the road and they were halfway buried in the ground and they were blocking a skid road that they didn't want people to drive down anymore. And so uh, my buddy was sitting on the uh, boulders with his back to that skid road facing the truck. And the truck was about 50, 50 feet behind us. And I was standing up with my back to the truck, 
looking down that road and the road uh, is lined with trees and brush and it goes down at a very slight gradual slope and about 30 yards down it makes a slight bank to the left and on the right of that bank is heavy brush and there's old growth timber behind it and so standing there my eyes were kind of drawn to that brush because about eight feet up there was an opening in it and it was uh, about four feet wide maybe three feet tall two and a half three feet tall and you could see old growth timber behind it we've been there maybe 10 minutes and my eye was drawn to that opening about the third or fourth time i looked down there on the one of the tree trunks back there i see some movement and i thought maybe it was a raccoon or something crawling up the tree and i thought oh that's kind of interesting i didn't say anything to my buddy i was just watching it and this thing leans out from the tree and it's about oh 120 feet from me about 40 yards away and uh, i see a face and it's got two eyeballs a nose a mouth and it's kind of shaded area. I can't tell the color of the skin or the color of the hair yet. And after about, I'm staring at it like dumbfounded, like, what's that? You know, it looks kind of oddly human-like almost. And so this thing ducks back behind the tree. And I'm just standing there like, man, thinking to myself, what is that? Well, then maybe 30, 40 seconds later, this thing reappears. What it did is it came about 20 feet closer directly to that opening and it stood up in the opening. I see this thing stand up and I see it from the upper chest, just above its pecs to the top of its head. And I, and in shock, I see this he- silver hair on this head. And the f- first thing I thought when I saw it, I thought it looks old. It looks really, really old. It had silver hair on its head and had kind of had this odd shaped head. It didn't roll back like a human. It kind of came up and slanted backward and up on the forehead and it didn't have any hair on the forehead and the skin was like an old beat up baseball glove. It was kind of this tannish color, brownish color, but it was all wrinkled and scarred up and it had a heavy brow, like a Frankenstein brow, these black eyes. And then it had this nose. It was hooded like a human, but it was really odd. It was really fat on the face. And then the, the oddest thing was the distance between the bottom of the nose and the top lip. The human's like, you know, you put one finger there is normally a distance. This is much further. There is a large gap there. And then the lips were really skinny and wide on the face. And then this chin was kind of flat and there was like no neck. This thing looked like a a massive bodybuilder and the hair, like I said, on the head was, was silver and it was long and wiry looking and greasy looking. And then when it hit its shoulders, it was hard to tell if it was uh, silver and brown or silver and black because it looked greasy and dirty and uh, if something's dark brown and greasy it might appear black so me and this thing are staring at each other and i i'm guesstimating maybe 40 45 seconds goes by then this thing realizes that i see it and it squints its eyes and gives me this and it look like it's really angry and i'm just freaked out you know, i was i was in shock you know at what i was seeing and so i told my buddy i said Doug, I pointed at it. I said, well, look at that. What is that? And when I did, this thing, Doug stood up and turned around, and then it turned to its left, and it took off. But I remember when it turned to its left, the, the hair down the whole back was silver. It was like a mane almost, and this thing bolted and took off. So my immediately reaction was I turned, and I ran to the truck. So I thought I didn't know what this thing was going to do. I didn't know if it was going to come at it, come after us or what. I turned, I ran to the truck, and I had my forty four mag in my backpack. And I thought I don't have time to dig for it, but on the floor in the back seat I had the AR-15, and I grabbed it and I grabbed a 40-round mag and I put it in, put it in the, the mag well, pulled the handle, turned the safety off, and came running back over. My buddy goes, "What was it?" And I said, "It was a Sasquatch." And my buddy's like, "Come on, dude, really? Man, no, no joke in here, really?" And I said, "Dig, I'm not kidding." And I, I was trembling, like visibly trembling. I had goosebumps on me. He's like, man, you need to calm down. I said, dude, I, I know what I saw. I said, this thing was, was massive. I said, it, it filled that whole opening. You know, I pointed at the opening. So he says, let's go down there. And I'm just like, I, I, don't, I don't know if I can, you know? And so after five, about five minutes, I calmed down a little bit. I, I thought, okay, well, let's go down there. So I'm in the lead with the rifle. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just trembling walking down there. We get to the brush. He was standing behind and I pushed through with the muzzle of the rifle and the forest floor here in Washington and a lot of areas, specifically the North Cascades, the forest floor is heavily shaded and it's the th- it's thick moss, like four or five inches of moss. When you step, it's like stepping on a sponge. But underneath the moss is like broken tree branches that have fall in the winter from the snowfall. Then the moss grows them and they start to rot. So it's really hard to walk. And so we, we step in there and we see these impressions of these giant feet in the moss and they're like, 
20 inches long and like 10 inches wide at the widest point. And we look up to the opening. I said, it was standing right here. Look at this opening. The top of this opening is like 10 feet. So this thing is huge. I mean, it's got five foot wide shoulders. It's around 10 foot tall. It's leaving these tracks that are, you know, 20 inches long. And so these like impressions go to its left and they go about 20 feet behind that original tree that it was leaning behind. And we, the stride's like six feet. So we follow these impressions over there. And on the other side of that tree that I first saw, it was a fallen tree, an old growth fallen tree, probably about three feet in diameter. And on that was a pile of picked mushrooms and, a, and it's like a giant, some kind of leaf, big leaf. And there was a handful of slugs and snails in it, like it was gathering food. And so my buddy, at this point, I, I seen enough. I said, man, Doug, I said, this thing was gathering food. Uh, we disturbed it. It's pissed off. And so he goes, look at the impressions that go off into the woods. Let's follow it. And I said, no, I said, I've seen enough. And he goes, I want to follow it. So I, I said, I had enough. I stepped back out onto the skid road about 40, 50 feet from him. And now he's in the woods following these tracks and I'm paralleling him and I'm walking down this skid road and he's off to my right. And I could, sometimes I can't see him because of the, the brush and stuff, but off to my left is more gro- old growth timber. And off to my left, I hear this like smashing of branches and breaking of branches and like these loud pounding footsteps and something over my left is pissed off. And then I hear the same thing back where he's at and he comes running out of there onto the skid road. He goes, it's back in here. It's pissed off. And I said, well, there's something on this side of the road too. And it's pissed off. I said, we need to get out of here. And so, uh, we walk back out of there. I walk out of there real slow, uh, backwards with my rifle pointed down there in case they came at us. And, the AR-15, even if, you know, a 10-foot tall, 1,000-pound creature came at me, it ain't going to do anything to it anyway. But, it, you know, it was the first thing I grabbed. So we get back, we walk back up to the boulders. And, and what I did at this point, you know, it was wrong, and I know, I know it was wrong. But I was so filled with fear and adrenaline, and I was pissed about being so scared that I emptied my entire rifle, 40-round magazine, back into the woods. And so... Uh, we ran over to the truck after I did that and tore out of there. And there was a few minutes of silence. And and I, I look up at Doug and I said, uh, hey, you still want to overnight out here? <laughs> and I was trying to break up the tension a little bit, you know. And he's like, no, man, I, I, I don't uh, I know. Oh, let's go. So we, we tore out of there went went home. And uh, th- that was uh, how it all began. Okay. Mark, is it okay if we go back and ask you just, I only got a couple questions here for you. Okay. Originally, when this thing was leaning out right at the very beginning from the tree, how did it lean out? Like, was it, can you describe that a little bit for me? Yeah, it was, all I saw was uh, its head. It, it just like, first, it was just like it's, uh, I'm looking down there and it leaned out from the tree to my left and from its right. So all I saw was like one eyeball and nose and part of the mouth and the chin and the hair and then then it leaned out further and I saw the whole head. So I didn't really, I didn't only saw the head uh, and face at the, the first time I saw it. Okay. And the second time that you saw it, did it lean out the same way? No, it stood up in the opening. It, it like it disappeared behind the tree. And then uh, I thought 20, 30 seconds later, it, it moved closer towards me right to that opening in the brush and it stood up and I seen it stand up first. It came up, with the top of its head, and then when it fully stood up in that opening, I saw it from its upper chest to the top of its head. In the moment that it first leaned out, what were you doing at that exact moment? Oh, we were standing there taking a break, and I was just looking down there thinking that, you know, what, what is that movement, you know? And, uh, yeah, I was in shock, you know, what I was seeing. I uh, just, I never believed in the subject. I knew right away it wasn't a human just by the by the way it looked. It kind of had a didn't have any hair on the face. It kind of had this uh, Down syndrome look to it. I hate to say that, but it did. It had this, this face kind of had a Down syndrome look. Okay. And whenever you saw the eyes, how large were the eyes and about how far apart were they? I, I would say, I mean, at a distance of, you know, 40 yards, I mean, the eyes were big. I mean, they were <laughs> much bigger than a human's and they were, they were black and they were, were uh, you know, the brow was like a Frankenstein brow, you know, thick, thick brow. <laughs> it, it was the strangest thing I've ever seen. It was, it was unbelievable. Okay, a couple more questions here. Whenever you walk down the trail, you know, after you got the AR-15, you're walking down, you hear the noises on the left, your buddy hears the noises on the right. 
about how far off were the noises that you heard? You know, maybe 50 feet away, but the forests are so thick here, you, you know, you can't see 20 feet, you know, uh, and some, you know, with how some of the growth, you know, I mean, it was maybe 50 feet away from me. Did you see any movement in the growth that would verify that what you're hearing and seeing is right there? No, no, I didn't. Like you couldn't, like I said, you couldn't see 20 feet in. It's just so thick, you know, it's like jungle here, you know? Okay. And then the last thing that I want to address, that's the firing into the wood line. Whenever you did that, what was going through your mind? Yeah, I was freaked out of my mind. I never believed in anything like that. Never, never expected to run into anything like that. And then it was like seeing a monster, you know. I knew that from being out there and where we were, I wasn't shooting towards any humans. I mean, there's, we were out in the middle of nowhere. There was a hill backdrop a couple hundred yards away. There was no other trails or roads. And I know what I saw wasn't human. And uh, when I was shooting, I was at a higher point. Uh, Like I said, I was looking kind of down at the creature kind of a little bit. So when I was shooting, I was actually shooting probably, you know, even if they were standing there, it would have been, you know, 20, 30 feet over their heads anyway. I just wanted the noise. I wanted them to know, you know, don't, don't even mess with me. You know, I'm not, and reality, probably the AR-15 with what I saw that, you know, the thing was like 10 foot tall. It, it, it wouldn't have phased it anyway. It would have just, but I felt, I, I was just, I was just freaked out. I, 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 my whole world was shattered and, uh, yeah, I, I, I was just, I wouldn't do it again, but it, it was, uh, it, it was just, it was mind numbing what happened. So, all right, Mark, go ahead and take us into your next encounter. Um, so yeah, uh, we had been at it, uh, after that, we'd been going out there every, every, every weekend for a couple of years. And, uh, Doug, my friend Doug and I ended up having a falling out over the subject and he ended up moving on, didn't want to be involved in it anymore. So I had, uh, was, looking for a new partner and I got a guy from work who, who wanted, who was interested in the subject, didn't know anything about it. Decided we, we started going out there. And then, uh, another guy from work had heard what, what, what we were doing and he wanted to go. So I took both of them out there on, uh, July 8th of last year. And we were, oh, were going to overnight, we were going to overnight in the exact same spot where I saw it at the boulders. And I had been to that spot five six dozen times since then with the, with my original partner doug there was all kinds of activity there you know i got rock throwing on video you know i used to hide a, a camera in our in the truck and they would throw rocks at the truck so we decided to camp there and we get there uh it doesn't get dark till around 10 o'clock here in july so we got in there around seven and set up our tent and we were just sitting there and uh we decided uh, once it got dark to go walk around a bit, we went walking around, around a little bit. We heard some things, uh, some thuddy noises, and uh, which I attribute to them pounding their feet. They do that kind of an intimidation, to intimidate you. So it must have been around 1 a.m. We decided to hop into the tent. We we left the, uh, it was a rather large tent. It sleeps 10 people. And, and we left the rain fly off of it. So it was just a screen above us. Well, the, one of the guys had fell asleep right away. And uh, me and the other guy were laying there awake and I was just listening and we could hear after being in there about 30 minutes and with one guy snoring, we could hear pops of brush, you know, branches breaking, you know, you could hear like something was approaching our camp. And so it's getting closer and closer and then it would stop and then it would move closer and closer. And so uh, it's pitch black out there. You can't, you, you, you put your hand in front of your face, you can't even see it. So I'm laying there. I have two firearms with me. I have a 45 and a Smith and Wesson 500 and I've got a 2000 lumen flashlight in my hand. And my buddy next to me has a Smith and Wesson 460 and the other guy doesn't have, he's not, he's unarmed. And so we're laying there and, and I'm kind of whispering like, man, Hey, do you hear that? And he's like, yeah, I hear that. So then it gets closer and closer to the tent. It's literally within 10 to 15 of the feet of the tent. We can hear, this strange gibberish whispering, this talking, like two of them are talking. And it's all really strange. I, I've heard the, the, the talk before out there uh, with, when I was with Doug, and it's really raspy and fast talking. It's, you know, it kind of sounds like, uh, it's really soft and we can hear it, and it's right next to the tent. So 
I turned my flashlight on. I said, Hey, and I shine my flashlight and I didn't shine it in the right where I thought I was, but this thing lets out this growl. It's just all, and me and my buddy freak out. And the other guy wakes up and he's like, what is that? You know? And, uh, we could hear him take off through the tree line. We could hear the popping and breaking get further away. So we get out of the tent and we're, you know, it's pitch black out there. When we got a couple of flashlights, we're looking around. It's not there, you know? So we didn't, nonetheless, we sat up the rest of the night, uh, waiting and they never, it never came back. They never came back to our, to our camp, but, uh, the, the, the growl, the scream and growl that this thing lit out, uh, it, you could, you could feel it vibrate through your body. You know, it was, I've heard soft growls out there before, but this was like, you could feel your teeth almost vibrate, you know? It was pretty scary. Just quick question on that one. How far away was the talking from where you were laying? Oh, it was like maybe not even 20 feet away. I mean, they were right up on the tent. We had this, the, the rain fly off, but it was pitch black. You know, you couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. And so that's at that point, I thought, man, this might be a good opportunity. You know, I just thought I was shining the flashlight into the right spot, but uh I, I didn't so but uh yeah then it let out this screaming growl you know it's just it's pretty scary <laughs> yeah and just to piggyback on what you're saying there is i heard one one time within 20 feet now it was on the other side of a wall and it was speaking through a window but when it spoke like i dropped to the ground and put my hands over my head uh, i guess when you're scared your body naturally protects your head first but the reason I did that wasn't because of the sound, but I felt it hit my face. Now, the talking, the gibberish, I've never heard the gibberish in person, but I've heard um, what s- sounds more like language, like actual, you know, broken up words and speech. Have you ever heard that as well, or do you contribute both of them being the same thing? Uh, every time I've, I've, I've heard, uh, it's always been a whisper, but it's been a raspy whisper, like they were forming words and and sounds of letters but it, it was really fast uh really fast talking and it maybe if you could get a recording of it, a solid recording of it and slow it down you might it might make more sense but uh i did catch a recording on a head i, I usually wear a camera on my head when i'm out there in the woods because i like to have my hands free i uh, did we did catch a recording some audio that i sent to david ellis from the olympic project he sent it back to me i put it on my channel um, it's called Bigfoot Sounds, but uh, yeah, that was, was pretty amazing. But uh, I, I would have normally had a camera with me in the tent, but through everything I found out out there, the, the the dozens and dozens of times I've been out there, there's something about a camera, and it's not the fact that it's it's a foreign object. It's the fact that cameras are given something off out of the lens, some kind of heat, some kind of light, some kind of uh, high-pitched sound that humans can't hear. And I say that because uh, I've tried to hide cameras on the truck, and I can never get them on video uh, with cameras hidden in the truck. But they will throw rocks at the truck, and you will actually see the rocks flying out of the trees and, and hitting the truck. And then uh, I found one location completely by mistake. Um, I had a camera on my backpack, and we were walking down a logging road. And we've seen this uh, figure climb down from the hillside, and it's kneeling in the ditch, and it's about 80 yards behind us. And this figure stands up on the side of the road and casts a shadow on the road. And uh, we went back after we found it on video and found the spot. This thing was about five foot tall, and I think it was juvenile. So I, what I did is I got these little thumb cameras. They're made by Veho, V-E-H-O. It's called a Movie Pro, and they're about the size of your thumb. They don't give off great video. It's two megapixel, but they were cheap at the time, and I was just new into this, and I wasn't going to invest a bunch of money. So what I did is I would go to that same spot, and I would leave uh, apples and Snickers bars unwrapped, and I would point one of these small little cameras on a little tree branch pointed at the food. And the first time I did that, you could hear something like footsteps on the gravel come up behind the camera and then something like directly behind the camera clack two rocks together like clack clack and then it never took the food and it was almost as if when i watched the video and i listened to it it was like mocking me like saying like (laughs) i know what this is you're not fooling me 
but here, you know, clack, clack, you know, I want you to know I'm here, clack, clack, you know? And so what I did was, uh, I started, I just said, okay, I'm going to take the food out there. I'm going to point the camera away from the food. I come back, food's gone, go home, watch the video. You can hear these footsteps on the gravel right behind the camera Two, two clacks, clack, clack. Food's gone, you know, but the camera, the guy pointed the camera away from it. There's something about the camera lens. It's not the fact that it's a game camera, that it's infrared. It's a camera in general. And I'm I'm convinced of it. That's why people can't get them on game cameras and people have a hard time getting them on video. They they know that they're afraid of them. There's something, they know something's up. Yeah, I totally agree with you there. So what was the next encounter that happened? This last January... You know, the weather here in the wintertime, it's either snowing or raining. And so I wanted to go expand my search a little bit uh, and leave the area that I had been doing a lot of work in. I thought, I've bothered these area here for two years. I'm going to leave them alone for the winter. So I, I went online and I did a search for missing people. And I went to the uh, Skagit County Sheriff's Department's website and did uh, on cold cases. And there was a gentleman that went missing up near Mount Baker on his mountain bike in, in uh uh, 2002 and uh he was on a on a uh, uh a gravel road a, a logging road that other uh, mountain bikers had seen him on and the guy completely fell off the face of the earth never found his bike uh never found any any trace of him whatsoever so the, in the report it gives the road so uh me and two guys from work uh, uh, the one guy that I has been going with when we normally and then a new guy started at work wanted to go and so I went on Google Maps and I found the road and I said, okay, uh, we're going to stick near water sources, any creek or stream. And I picked seven spots I wanted to go look at up on these logging roads. All of them were near a creek or a stream. We went up there and uh, I would drive the logging road and I would stick. I would, I would leave the window out, down out and look. And I was looking for game trails, anything that was looked like could have been game coming in and out of the woods. And the fourth one we stopped at, I, w- I just parked the truck, left the keys in it. And we jumped out real quick, and we uh, went up into the tree line. We're looking around real quick, and one of the guys looks back, and he goes, hey, what's that on top of your truck? And we'd only been away from the truck maybe three minutes, maybe four minutes at the tops. We're only in the woods maybe about 30 feet. I said, I don't know. What's that on top of my truck? So we walked back down, and uh, have an older Dodge pickup with a, with a canopy on it. There is a rock about the size of a golf ball sitting on top of the canopy. And we're looking at it like, there's no way we drove up here with a rock. These roads are steep. You know, we didn't hear anything fall and land on the truck. Uh, what's going on here? And so uh, it had been slightly drizzling, and you could see where something had disturbed the water droplets on the truck, like it dragged their hand across it. One of the guys picks the rocks up and smells it, and it stinks like a skunk. You know, it stinks bad. So I'm like, okay, uh, let's grab our backpacks, our firearms, and I'll grab my camera equipment. Let's go back up into the woods here. So I wear a camera on my head. I have one in my hand, and I'm in the lead, and I step, we climb up this little embankment of like this game trail. And as soon as I step into the woods, this rock comes flying from my right and lands directly at my foot. And all three of us saw it and heard it. And uh, my buddy's like, man, that rock was just thrown right at you. So I'm like, whoa. And then this, the second time I've smelled them, I've only smelled them one other time. And that was when I was in a tent and they were walking around my tent. But this, like, a fan blew it at me. It was like this waft of odor. Uh, it, you know, it's like feces, rotten meat, and urine all mixed together. And I knew the smell and I was like, oh my God, you know, but the, the forest is real thick. You can't see very far. So we walked back in there. Um, it, it's hard to walk in. You know, there's thick moss and ferns on, 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 and broken branches. We walked back in a couple hundred feet, and directly behind the guy in the back, we hear two rocks clack together. And so we're like, okay, there's something going on here. And we spent the next few hours there and had a toll of uh, three more rocks thrown at us, which is pretty interesting. <laughs> they were thrown our direction, but never hit us. You know, they could have hit us if they wanted to. So uh, we decided to leave. You know, it was getting a little aggressive. So we came back the following week. This time we brought uh, one another guy, uh, one of the guys' uncle, who was always interested in the subject, uh, had been a hunter his entire life, you know, 
for 40 years, never seen or heard anything strange in the woods, wanted to come up and, and experience something. So uh, if we get there, we walk around, we're there about 45 minutes and I'm a little worried. Like I, I don't, you know, I don't know what's going on, you know? And uh, well, actually before we had walked away from the truck, I took a Sony handy camera and I left it in a uh, soft lunch case. I cut a, I have a, a soft lunch bag. I cut a hole out for the lens. I usually leave it on the dash or the center console not that I'm trying to get them on video. I know they're not going to step in front of the camera, but they will throw rocks at, at the pickup truck. So we leave the truck. We go into the woods. We're in there about 45 minutes, and we're getting ready to cross this little stream. And as soon as I go to take a step to cross it, a rock hits a stump just to our right, and it came from the other side of the creek. So we walk back through there, um, and we're in there for a couple hours, and we had at that point, uh, a total of seven rocks th- thrown our direction. All of them had hit trees or hit the ground. And so we finally figured out uh, at one point where the rocks were coming from. They were coming from the bottom of, of the, the rise we were on behind a stump. And then there's a logging road and there's more forest on the other side. We kind of figured out that they were, one of them probably was running across the road with th- Bob a rock and then run back to the other side and hide the tree line on the other side. So we crossed the logging road go back in on the other side, same thing. We're having rocks thrown at us. So it's getting kind of aggressive. The rocks were first lobbed in. Now these next two rocks came in like 100-mile-an-hour fastballs. I mean, and they were aiming for us. They weren't trying to miss us. And the rocks are bigger this time. Instead of being golf ball size, now they're baseball size. So it's getting dangerous. So I said, hey, uh, we've been here about three hours. Uh, This is getting dangerous. We need to leave. So we turned to leave, we walk about 15 feet, and I felt Ron kind of yell, and then I felt something hit my back of my thigh, and something had lobbed uh, a rock uh, about the size of a baseball, hit Ron in the back, and then ricocheted and hit me in the back of the thigh. And so uh, we ended up getting out of there. Um, That was pretty intense. I had never, uh, I've had rocks tossed at me on other occasions, but not thrown you know, you can hear them coming. I mean, as they whiz past you at 100 miles an hour. At that point, I think they were trying to hurt us. It's pretty scary. <laughs> so I want. I tried to go back a third time to that spot, and I was stopped by somebody who said that I was on private property. I said, oh, I didn't realize I was on private property. Uh, and he goes, well, you can't be here. This is my property. And I said, well, I'm, I'm just up here shooting some video and pictures. He says, I don't care. You can't be here. And I said, well... I explained to him the situation. I told him what was going on. And he said, I don't want to talk about that. He goes, I don't want you on my property again. If you come on my property, I'm going to have you arrested. So I said, okay. So at that point, that was over. So um, I finally figured out a way um, behind his property up on the hill is DNR land. It's called Department of Natural Resources, state property, which anybody's allowed to go on to. You can go on to, you can high camp you can shoot your firearm target practice as long as you have this thing called a discover pass so we went up there to that same spot uh last friday and we went to the dnr side up above his property about 400 yards to the woods and we climbed down through the woods made it down to the same spot where all this occurred in january and this time uh nothing not there there but and i think they weren't there because all the creeks and streams were dried up. There was no water. So I think there might be there in, in the winter time at that, that location. They might move on somewhere else in the sun. Now that it's you know almost summer, uh, those smaller creeks and streams are dried up. So, which is kind of discouraging. So, but at least I found a way to try and to get back down on, on down onto that property without being seen. So, Mark, I've got a quick question here. And as you know, all of us who have seen these creatures or have had experiences with them, they consume your thoughts. And so a lot of shows don't like for people to speculate. However, I do because sometimes that provides a level of insight that the listener is looking for. That day with all the aggressive rock throwing and then eventually getting hit, now that you've thought about it, what do you think brought that on? And why do you think they, they were doing it that day? I think that uh, they don't have much human contact there. It's private property. I, one thing I did forget to leave out, there was a lot of deer and elk droppings everywhere we looked. There was, there was especially elk. There was a lot of elk droppings. And I think that we had just 
they might have been there, you know, hunting the elk, and we were walking in, disturbing their area. They were rather upset about it. Yeah, I, I, I'd been hit. I've been, I've had rocks tossed at me before, smaller rocks. Uh, one time I was hit in the back with a rock, but it hit my backpack. And you know, another time I was hit in the shoulder with a small little rock, about the size of a quarter. It was just lobbed my way. But uh, yeah, you, when you can start hearing the rocks coming. I don't know if you've ever been to a major league baseball game and been by the bullpen and heard the pitchers throw it the other they're warming up, you know, you, you could hear hear them coming. I mean, it was as they whizzed past you. Uh, and then one, once we got hit, uh, if we, we would have been hit in the head, we one of us, we would have been killed. I mean, there's, no, there's no doubt about it. Uh, so it was time to leave. So, but uh, maybe I'll try and make it back there uh, in January, this next January to that same spot. But uh so I'd been kind of concentrating on areas on DNR land in that same area with usually within a mile or two. And, uh, we ended up camping a couple, a couple had contacted me. They had camped at a location out there uh, in the last summer and their dog was killed in the middle of the night by something outside their tent. And, uh, it was a Rottweiler. And so they were afraid to get out of their tent the rest of the night. And the next morning they found their dog, uh, in the, about a hundred feet back in the tree line stuffed up in some tree branches, about 12 feet up. I mean, it was torn in half. So they had sent me an email and said, Hey, you might want to go look at this area. You know, we filed a report with fishing game over it, blah, blah, blah. They said it was a bear. He goes, the guy goes, but well, what was going on? He goes, I don't believe it was a bear. So we ended up camping there a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, that area has been logged since then directly above the camp is still heavily treed, but below the camp, kind of this hill hillside, goes about 300 yards. It's, it's all logged out. So me and my buddy went there, we built a fire, had my camera equipment. Uh, we were just hanging out by the fire. And after midnight, we could hear, um, those strange foot pounds. I don't know if you've ever heard them or not. They, what they sometimes will do, they will pound their feet on the ground to try and intimidate you. And so up in the tree line where the trees are at, we could hear the foot pounding. And then down below us, we could hear this, this tree pounding. So I have a camera in my hand. I'm, you know, with a flashlight, flashing back into the forest. I go back over near the fire and my camera picked up uh, eye shine in the trees uh, directly uh, about a hundred feet away in the, in the, in the wood line. I never saw it at the time, but my camera picked it up and I put the, put that on my channel. It was kind of, it's kind of interesting um, how close, to, how close they were. But uh, so, yeah. Uh, and then uh, last weekend we went up, uh, I met a gentleman. Uh, well, he, uh, I've, I've known him for a while, but uh he said, Hey, I want to take my son Bigfoot and where should I go? And I said, well, go up over here and get off trail, walk to the woods, just list, sometimes sit down and listen and be quiet. So, but he went higher up. He went up to the top of this peak. Uh, it goes up about 5,000 feet. And, uh, while they're up there, they had tree knocks going all around him and his son whips out his iPhone and gets this video footage of one about, uh, 150 feet away from him, just standing there in between two trees, staring at him. He sent me the footage. and uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. I put that on my channel. But we went up there uh, uh, last week, uh, yeah, last weekend to the same location. And I, and, and I found these before. I don't know if you've ever heard or seen them or, or heard people talk about them. Uh, in a lot of spots I go where they are, you'll find these tree branches that will broke off trees. And then they break the smaller branches off. And then they shove the sticks into the ground. These branches into the ground like six to eight inches like fence posts. I don't know if you've ever heard that before. So we found a bunch of those. We found three of them. It was kind of odd. They were in a perfect triangle, about 10 feet apart on each side. I found a couple footprints, and then uh, we heard some sticks breaking on this hillside up above us, a couple, about 100 feet away, and we ended up catching something on video peeking at us from behind a tree. It was, it was pretty interesting. But um, When it comes to the eye shine you saw that night, what color was it? Well, I didn't see it with my naked eye. I got it on video. It's white but with a slight amber tint to it uh yellowish i guess yellow amber yellowish amber tint to it and some some of the video but most of the video when my flashlight's kind of shining not directly on it but in in its kind of way you you could you could see it and you could yeah, clearly see it in some of it two eyes and in some of the video it looks like it turns its head you can see one eye and partially the other one and then it, some of the video you could actually see it like it looks like it's blinking Mark, I know you've had a, just an absolutely terrifying encounter with a couple of juveniles. Would you be okay if you share that encounter with us? 
Yeah, sure. I don't, uh, I don't talk about it too much cause I didn't have a camera with me, but, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about it. Uh, John, uh, Ben Renogel, everybody knows who he is. He, he passed away this last March. He is a friend of mine. He, he came to my research area, uh, in April of, uh, 2016, at the end of April. We spent two days together out in the woods. We got to know each other really well. And after that, we became really good friends. But when he left, uh, I took him back to his vehicle. He left me this uh, game camera and he said, uh, hey, Mark, I want you to go out and hang this somewhere for me. He go, And I go, John, I said, I, game cameras, I don't think are going to work. And he goes, he goes, well, would you do it for me? I said, yeah, I'll do it for you. So uh, a few weeks went by and I couldn't get my buddy to go. He was busy. I couldn't get anybody to go. So on a Monday morning, I work at night. So on a Monday morning, I uh, just grabbed my backpack. I put John left me the camera batteries and some uh, paracord to tie it up. And I grabbed a uh, ball of water. And I grabbed my 44 mag. I thought, I'm just going to run out there real quick. And um, where I know that... Uh, the the uh where i've been leaving those apples and stickers bars i said i'll walk back in the woods about 100 feet hang it and leave and and i'm terrified i I do not like going alone i i this is the first time i'd been alone out there Um, after seeing what i've seen i just i just don't like it so i thought well what i'll do is i'll park my truck before i get there and i'll walk in so I, i get there i park my truck i originally thought it was about a half a mile but when you drive, you know, on, on a freeway, whatever, it's easy to judge a half mile distance. But when you walk through windy gravel road, the woods, it's hard to tell. It was actually ended up being a mile. So I parked my truck. I, I, had, the, I had the stuff in my backpack, the 44 mag in my hip, and I'm walking in. And it actually took me 45 minutes because I'd walk away and I'd stop and listen, and I wasn't hearing anything. So I get to the spot where I had been leaving the food, and um, I'm a disabled vet. I don't, I don't uh, hike very well. I don't walk very well. I have walked with a heavy limp, had problems with both my legs, but especially my right leg. So doing this Bigfoot thing, it's, it's very difficult on me. So I get there, I have to, I get to the edge of the road where I'm going to climb in. And that part of the forest behind me is a steep, a steep mountainside, but the, the forest is real th- thick and steep. And right there, it's kind of flat, but thick. And uh, I have to step over some water. Originally I thought it was a stream, but it was just a pool of water. And there's a down tree about two feet in diameter. I got to step over. And so I'm the forest floor again is thick moss and there's branches underneath it. And I'm looking down, trying not to trip and fall. And I get in about 20 feet and through my vision in front of me behind a tree, I see, uh, uh, it must've been, I don't know, it was probably 20 feet from me, maybe, maybe, maybe 15 feet from me, something big and black. Uh, I see movement. So I look up and stepped out from this tree is a, about a six foot two, six foot three, completely muscular, short haired, black juve, what I thought to be an older juvenile Sasquatch. And then off to the right behind a smaller tree steps out a smaller Bigfoot, maybe about five and a half foot tall, black in color. They both had gray skin on their face. And so immediately I determine the smaller one at that point isn't much of a threat to me that the, the bigger one is. So I'm standing there staring at it. And this whole counter took maybe 30 seconds. I'm, I'm watching it. It's I, I'm, I'm not really looking at its feet. I'm looking at its face. And I look at its right hand, and it's uh, it's moving its fingers really fast back and forth. And I can tell that the nails are kind of yellowish, like nail fungus. And uh, it looks like it's getting like, you know, a football player on the line when the ball's getting ready to hike. Like this thing's getting ready to make a move, you know. So I'm a little freaked out. So I take a step backward and this thing, you know, my steps are rather small. This thing takes a big step towards me. And then the smaller juvenile takes some real fast steps and gets behind the bigger one. And I don't see the smaller one after it at that point. So then the bigger one, I'm staring, I'm, I'm staring at his eyes. They're black. It opens its lips and I see its teeth. It didn't open its teeth, but I see its teeth and it makes this weird kind of motion gesture with its lips, like it's pointing with his lips and it growls at me. It's like, and his teeth are like horse teeth they're kind of big and square but they're uh kind of yellow and brownish and so i took he he took another step towards me and i took another step back and so then i turned i turned and i ran at that point and he when i I turned to start to run he was maybe 12 feet from me but i took one step and then he was already on me he wasn't touching me he was directly behind me as if trying to 
not, not at that point push me, but get me to go towards the road. And I'm trying to move as fast as I can. You know, I'm a disabled vet. I'm, I'm trying to get to the road. I get to the road, and as soon as I take my put my right foot on the gravel of the road, I have my backpack on. He hit me between my shoulder blades and my backpack, and I went flying and landed all the way on the other side of the road. The road is probably about 10 feet wide. I landed on my left side with my backpack on, and I'm trying to roll to my right, and I'm looking for him. And I reach down, and I unholst- I, I unsnap the holster on my 44 mag. I see that he's over my right shoulder, kind of behind me, and I'm trying to roll over. And I put my hand on my 44, and I, I see him turn, and he walks away from me. And as I see him walking away, I can see how muscular his body is, his calves. He, lo- he looked like a NFL linebacker, wide receiver, solid muscle, not an ounce of fat on him. He had short black hair, muscular thighs, calves, V-shaped back, just solid muscle. But he didn't have mass yet. He was probably about six foot three, maybe 220 pounds. And he turned and walked away. And I got up and made a jogging limp, heavy limp back to my pickup truck and tore out of there. All right, I've got a I've got a few questions here. Is that okay? Yeah. As you were walking up and you were crossing that what you thought was a stream but ended up being a puddle, how long had you been walking to get to that point? So how far were you away from your vehicle? I was what I thought was a was a half a mile ended up being a mile because we had gone back and set the odometer and drove it and it was right at right at a mile. Okay, and were you paralleling a, a gravel road then? Is that why you were so close to the gravel road? Yeah, well, I was. Yeah, I was walking. I was walking on this logging road, uh, this gravel, and uh, it's not heavily traveled at all. And it was the same location, actually, where I said that I had been leaving food and the smaller, the little thumb cameras, and and I, my backpack had caught that what I thought was a juvenile climb down from the hillside and cast a shadow on the road. And I think that smaller juvenile was that same one because it was the same spot same location okay so you're crossing that and then you see the movement and you look up when you first saw yeah. it step out what was going through your head what were you thinking were you thinking life or death I situation thought, right there or were you thinking some sort of um enjoyable contact is about to be made no i thought i, I thought i was dead i i really i really thought you know, it, it, you know, a million things run through your mind. You know, the whole encounter was maybe thirty seconds long, but I, I really thought, well, I'm, I'm done for. You know, I really, and then you know, to see him, the way he was moving his fingers really fast, and I thought maybe he was getting ready to make a break for me, and then I take a step back, and he takes a step towards me. I'm, I'm thinking he's, he, he's, he's gonna, he's gonna do me in. You know, and but when I look back on it, I had been leaving food there so much cat apples and snickers bars i think they knew i was coming that somehow they 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 knew i was there and i think what they were doing was okay that guy's gonna leave that food and when he leaves we'll grab the food after he leaves but instead of leaving food i walked in on them they had a choice they could either turn and run or face me and so they decided to face me and then when i made a break for the road and he hit me i think what he was trying to his point was you don't come in here. You stay out here. Don't don't come in here. You stay out here. He could have killed me if he wanted to. He, he could have easily. Can you explain how he was moving his fingers? He had his 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 right arm down to his side, and his and his right arm almost went completely down his thigh to his knee, and he was moving his all of his fingers in a fast motion. You know, like uh, if you ever seen a, a, a football player on the line, you know when he's he's moving his fingers, he's you know getting ready. To, you know when the ball's hiked to move, you know he was just moving his his all of his fingers in a fast motion back and forth. You know, <clears throat> and they were long they were long fingers. <laughs> Whenever he made that sound and moved his lips, can you explain that again? Yeah, it was like uh, I went back and looked, and you see uh, apes do it on on video. It was almost he was like pointing. Like he he opened his mouth, he didn't open his teeth, but it was almost like a gesture. It was like kind of almost like he was pointing towards the road, you know. It was like it was just really strange. Was he making an O shape with his lips and then pointing towards the road, or? Yeah, yeah, it was kind of like that. It was opening his mouth. I could see his teeth a little bit, and it was kind of a growl. And then it was like he was motioning be- like beyond me, like towards the road, like go that way or something. This kind of now that I look back on it, that's kind of the impression I get. 
Okay. And then as you would take a step back and he would step forward, like I'm trying to picture if someone is wanting to do someone else harm and they're kind of, you know, squared up to each other and someone, they take a step back and the aggressor is trying to show, you know, I'm wanting to come after you. He'll stomp real, you know, real quick and step forward. Was it like that or was it more cautious? No, it was cautious. He, he, he didn't, uh, it wasn't like a, uh, like you said, a stop, like a, a real fast step. It was, you know, I made, you know, a small, you know, just step back. He made obviously because his legs are longer and he takes bigger steps, a, a step towards me. And actually he closed the gap, you know, like when the, when this all first started, we were maybe uh, 15 feet from each other. And then after the second step, we were probably within 12 feet of each other, you know, and then that's when I turned and ran, you know, and I only got one step and he was already, I could feel him behind me. Were there any, did you see the genitals on either one of these creatures? Yeah, they were both, they were both males. Yeah. Okay. Are there any details that stick out in your mind that you kind of grasped onto when you were looking at this guy that, that were odd? Yeah. What was odd was, okay, the first one I saw had a brown skin and no hair on the face and kind of had a Down syndrome look. These two, and, and the first one had like a human nose. It was like, it was like hooded. These two had a hooded nose, but they had hair on their face, but the skin was gray, the gray skin on the face. And there was hair there, but there was skin around their eyes, their nose and their mouth. And then there was skin visible on their stomach and their chest. And it was gray also, but they looked more apish than the, 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 the first one, more, more of an ape look. Did either one of them sway back and forth at all that you can remember? No. No, I think they were shocked that I stepped in on them. The little one looked pretty terrified. His eyes were pretty wide, you know, like, you know, surprised to see that, you know, I had I had walked in. And I didn't really perceive him as a threat as at all. I mean, he probably could rip my arms off, you know. I mean, they're pretty, you know, apes are strong, chimps and apes, you know. So, but uh, I didn't perceive him as a threat. I didn't see any swaying. Yeah, he just looked more terrified than the big one. The big one wanted to intimidate, I guess. Okay, and whenever the little one shuffled behind the larger one, I know you were kind of glued on the larger one, but did it do so on two legs or four? Two. It walked on two legs like just like a teenager would. You know, that I, I said he was about five foot tall, maybe about five and a half foot tall, about 170 pounds maybe. Looked like a stocky teenager. He walked like a like a human. And do you think? Upright. Do you think as the larger one followed you out, the smaller one stayed put, or do you think he pursued as well? No, I, I think he stayed. I never saw him, even as I was laying on the road, uh, watching the other one, the bigger one, walk away. I, I never saw the, uh, the, the the smaller one after that at all. So, you know, this is a very unique encounter, and. It's you know yeah, it happened on uh happened on May sixteenth of uh two thousand sixteen. How has this I one still remember the day <laughs> encounter affected you as a person and then you as a researcher? Oh, it's terrified me tremendously. I don't like uh I have some rules now when I go squatching. I don't go alone. When I go uh with somebody else, we're never the rule is is we're never more than twenty feet apart from one another for safety factors, you know, I don't, uh, you know, during the day, I don't mind, uh, bushwhacking through the, the trees and the brush that off trail, you know, I like to get off trail and bushwhack through at night. Um, uh, there, there's not, there's no penetrating into the woods. We'll stay on the trail or on the road. You know, of course at night they're more active, but, um, yeah, it's changed. Uh, you know, I've set of rules now, you know, so. Do you think you've had any more encounters with these specific individuals? Oh Yeah. Yeah, definitely, because uh, I think I encountered the smaller one before that with, like I said, the footage I have of it standing on the side of the road about 80 yards behind us, casting a shadow. And I've been back to that same spot dozens and dozens of times since then, leaving food, doing the same thing. Uh, what I'll do is go there and I'll just take a camera and set it on a branch like a Sony Handy camera. It pointed back into the woods, and not that I'm trying to get him on camera. I know that I won't be able to, but I'll just set the camera and leave it, and maybe come back the next day or a couple hours later and grab the camera, and there'll be, uh, it's on my channel, there'll be, uh, I caught uh, audio of a tree being pushed over. Uh, I caught numerous audios of rock clacking. We're taking rocks and clacking them together. 
there's audio of them, you know, the cameras there, you know, looking in the woods, you could hear the footsteps on the gravel behind the camera. Yeah, it's they're they're there. And and what I think is uh they have a uh, a guard there, you know, a, a sentry that's there to warn the family unit uh that humans are near, you know. There's not many people go down that logging road. I mean, it's it's not traveled hardly at all. So um, they kind of have free reign of the area, and I think they keep a guard there uh, as, as you know, to, to, watch, to let the family know that there's danger in the area, you know? Tonight, I'd like to welcome John on the show. John, thanks for coming on, man. No problem, buddy. Let's go ahead and get into your encounter tonight, and when you're telling it, try to remember every detail that you can, and try to explain the landscape as best as possible, okay? No problem at all. Take it away. Okay, well... My- all right, my name is John Chamont. I live in Lafayette, Louisiana. Uh, it's way down south by the Gulf. And uh, we, I was young. This was in 67, 1967 or 1968. And, uh, but, I mean, we started out hunting and fishing and trapping and all that when you're young, you know. So I already knew the woods, already knew what it was all about and whatnot. And uh, we live and die by the levee system out here. Uh, we hunt and fish in the basin, the Chafalaya Basin, and crawfish and trap and whatever there is else there is. Now, this was, uh, I was about six or seven, and we everything is done at the levee. I mean, we go and fish and swim and hang out and barbecue and ball crawfish and all that. It's a big deal now, the levee. They have stores and bars and landings and whatnot all along there. Um, so my dad, my mom, and my uncle and my aunt were there. And, uh, you know, I'd been hunting with my uncle and my dad before. So we're there barbecuing, and I'm just messing around there. And they had the blanket out, and they're all sitting on the blanket and drinking beer and my dad was a big music fan. I'm the same way. And he always had music. You know, he had the old RCA record player with the batteries in it. And he would bring his records, man, and play them and barbecue. And it was a great time. You know, we just had a good time. So they're sitting there on the blanket, all talking, kind of, and nobody's paying attention to me. And I see. We're, we're right along between the levee and a wood line of woods, deep woods. I mean, back then there was nothing back there. Yeah, even now, there's nothing. You can go for miles and not see a person. You know, you just can't get into the middle of the basin. I mean, you just can't do it. Anyway, so I noticed a trail, man, going right back where from where they're sitting. And that trail goes right back into the woods. So I'm there, and I'm bored. I look at it, and I said, man, I want to go explore that. So I I start walking down this little trail. Now, my dad was the old Cajun hardcore dad. In other words, his word was law, never to be questioned or anything. And there was grave consequences to that. And one of his rules was, hey, look, he told me, it's not my job to watch you. It's your job to make sure that you that I can see you at all times. Don't ever get out of my sight. So those words were in my, ringing in my head, but I'm walking down this little trail, and I'm looking down for snakes. Now, this is early, early spring where there's not much leaves on the tree. It's cloudy. It's, it's a little cool. It's perfect, you know? We don't really have winter down here, but it was perfect. So I'm walking down this trail, and I would look over my shoulder once every once in a while to make sure my dad could see me. But it was straight back. But it went straight back, and it curved to the right. But anyway, I'm walking straight down this trail, and I'm looking down for snakes, <laughs> really. Uh, copperheads and moccasins are bad. I had a, a friend who got bit by a copperhead the other night. But anyway, I'm walking back there, and it goes down. I'm looking down, and maybe look to the left and the right and whatnot. 
but uh, my head is pretty much down the whole way. So I keep on walking, and then I get to the back, and I notice this. I'm starting to notice, hey, man, this, this trail cuts to the right. And if I do that, if I do go to the right, my daddy won't be able to see me. So when I'm right before that, that curve to the right, I thought to myself, okay, I got to turn around. So I'm going to get in some serious trouble. I got to get back to my dad. So right before I'm going to turn around, man, I'm right there to get the curve. And there's a big tree, like right at the apex of the curve. So I'm, I'm about to turn around, and all of a sudden, something catches my eye. I look, and what it is is something swaying side to side there slightly. I look up, and all I see is a dark mass uh, standing there. And I really couldn't see any features because the hair was in the eyes. It was scraggly. And the first thing my brain thought was, that's not hair. I mean, that's not fur. That's hair. You know, that was the first thing my brain was screaming at me. That's that's not fur. You know, and it was, they had leaves in the hair and all that. It was really scraggly. That's the word I could use, scraggly. And uh, so I froze, man, instantly. And I'm looking up where the eyes should be, you know. All I can see is dark hair. And the instant that my eyes come into contact with his, he, uh, the only way I can say this, Dustin, is he jutted his head forward. It was an odd move. You know, it's something that didn't fit, that humans can't do the way he did it. But he jutted his head forward. And at that point, all I could focus on were the eyes. They were evil. I mean, they were. He, this thing was so pissed off. That I felt everything he was thinking at that point. You know, I knew exactly what time it was. If I'd have took that right on that trail, I'd have been one of the missing kids. I have no doubt about that. He waited for me to walk down that trail. He stayed right there. He had been watching us. I don't know if it was the music, the talking, the barbecue smell, or the combination of all. But I could tell he had been there. He had been watching us. And he waited for me to get all the way down that trail. And when he how he jutted his head forward and he screamed at me. It was just a short burst of ah! like that. And it was, I mean, this thing was so pissed off that I saw it too soon. I wasn't supposed to see it that soon. I think he wanted me to, I know he wanted me to take that right where no one can see me. Yeah. He could have jumped out on the trail and got me right there. You know, there's always those people that say, you know, if he'd have wanted me, he could have had me at any time. That's true, but he'd have had to come out on the trail, and my dad and him would have saw him. He would have showed himself. I don't think he wanted that. He wanted me to go back around there where nobody could see, and he would have got me. I have no doubt that that thing wanted me. None whatsoever. Anyway, he jutted his head forward. He screamed at me, rah! And the eyes just stood out. Uh, they did have white. And they had like you know, the iris around it. And it was amber or gold. I remember those gold eyes. You know, that sticks out in my mind. And uh, man, this thing was just angry. Pure rage, you know, in his eyes. And I knew what he was mad about. He was mad because I saw him too soon. I say he... I don't know if it was a him or her, but I ain't seen his breast. I would have noticed that. But it screamed at me. And I was frozen. I mean, I would, couldn't move. I'm, I'm telling my legs to run, man. But they, I, I couldn't, you know. Now, this thing, the only thing I could really say about it is the face and the eyes. And the only thing I say about the face is it had that dark, Dark gray, light black, almost black face. Uh, leathery skin, Mike. You know, the skin was tough. Uh, to me, and what I told my dad when I ran back, uh, I'll finish the story, but I told him it was a hairy gorilla. To me, that's what it was. It was a hairy gorilla. So if you can envision that, that's, that's what it was. All I know about it is the eyes and the leathery face. 
I can't remember the teeth or the mouth. I know it screamed at me. But when it did, there was about a half a second pause. I was still frozen. But then my legs kicked in, man, and I started running. I ran so fast that I remember thinking, I'm going to fall because my feet aren't even touching the ground. I'm going so fast. I've never been able to run that fast again in my life. So I run down the trail. There's my dad and him, you know, oblivious to what's going on because the music loud and they're talking loud and they're just all into themselves. I come bowling out of that trail, man, and I dove right in the middle of the blanket. I mean, everything went flying. I totally destroyed it. You know, beer went flying, food went flying. I mean, and when I did that, while I'm doing that and touch flying, I'm thinking, I'm going to get a whipping. I'm so going to get a whipping for doing this, you know. Anyway, I uh, got my head together, and everybody's like, wow, you know, stuff is flying, and uh, what the hell? And I said, uh, y'all didn't hear that? Everybody said, yeah, what? I said, man, it, I, I, I saw a gorilla that hollered at me. It screamed at me, and my, everybody starts laughing, and my uncle started berating me, I mean, big time. You know, calling me names, you know, you, you can't, you just scared, you just, you know. But and that's the one thing, man, down here, you can't be scared of the wood. I mean, we, you know, you're going to be there in the dark checking traps and stuff. So it's a, it's a big thing. Don't be scared of the woods for a young man, you know, because they are scary. <laughs> anyway, he berates me and all this is going on. Now, the whole time, the first thing I thought was, my dad isn't saying anything. You know, he ain't screaming at me. He's not threatening me. He's not whipping me. I mean, what's going on? But he didn't say anything. So things kind of settle down, and I just go to the truck. I go to sleep. So later when we're home, my dad calls me to his chair. And when he did that, it was usually because I had a bad report card or something. But me going to talk to him at his chair never ended well for me. So I knew that I had to, it was time to truth the consequences, you know. And he come there, and I come there, and uh, he looked at me. All right, tell me what you saw again. So I told him, I said, Daddy, I'm not lying. I saw a gorilla. He said, well, son, there's no gorillas in Louisiana. Um, but, but what'd you see? You know, so I told him what I saw and he kind of has this puzzled look on his face. And that's when I knew he believed me, you know, cause I, uh, you know, I thought a, a hairy gorilla, you know, now they tell me there's no gorillas. So what am I supposed to say now? You know, but he believed it was like, wow, he believes me, you know? So he tells me, Son, look, what that is, is deep in the basin, there's this ancient tribe of Indians, and they shun society, they stay in the woods, and they become wild again. And he said, they have long hair, they don't shave, they just, all it is is long hair, they stink. He said, but, uh, if you have, but every once in a while, one will come out of the basin, and people will see him. He said, don't ever shoot at him. Uh, don't let him see you. Just back away and get out of the woods if you see one. And so that was fine. Then he tells me, you know, there's, there's another type. He said, but they have a snout and a tail. And that's what's called the Rugaru down here. He said, there's no magic to them or nothing like that. They don't, there's not people that turn into wolves. He said, it's just an animal that lives in the woods in the basin. And he said, those are really bad. He said, don't ever, if you ever see one of them, don't ever do it. And then he tells me a story about when he was 17, he was squirrel hunting. And on his way back, something paced him to the right of him, right in the woods, the whole way home. It followed him the whole way home. And he said it was on two feet. So uh, he had seen that. And then, <clears throat> you know, that same year, a few months later in the fall, 
squirrel season opened. And that's a big thing down here, the opening day of squirrel season. A lot of stores shut down and stuff like that. Yeah, but everybody goes camping. I love everybody goes I camping. Love it. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, that was to me when I was a kid. I, I wouldn't sleep the night before. Yep. You know, I know exactly. I had my gun with you. Oh man, I was just ready. I'd be up too early. You know, it's, it's not time. You know, <laughs> so I had to wait and we just go. But this trip, opening day season, my dad told me you can't come. He said, you know, he ain't had a construction company. He said, this is just for the men. It's the work, people I work with. So, you know, he says, just men. So I, I had to accept that. It hurt, man. It hurt bad. But anyway, <clears throat> so he leaves Friday afternoon. I'm crying. You know? So he leaves, and they were going to go the whole weekend. Now, where they went is up towards Toledo Bend. That is the West Louisiana line. And that's part of the Texas big ticket and all that. You know, it's just, it's just cut through by the Sabine River. And there's a lot of activity out there by the Sabine River, a uh, big ticket, as y'all know, and all that. And in Louisiana. Think about here, man, talking to the old people. You know, I've tried to talk to them, and I'm from here. And to get them to, say something about this is nearly impossible. You know, everybody, you have to put it to the back because you got to hunt. You know, you can't be scared, you know. Um, and uh, that's why no, no, not, not many stories come out of here, you know. Uh, but where my daddy going was up by Toledo Bend um, and they were camping up there and we used to hunt out there a lot. So Friday night's gone and Saturday mid morning, my mom was cooking, uh, my mom's washing dishes and there's a window right in front of the over the sink, you know? So she sees my dad pull up and I'm in the kitchen. She goes, what's your dad doing here? So we're looking out the window. I open the door. He comes through the door and he's got this weird look on his face. First thing I noticed. And, uh, my mom said, what, what's going on? Why are you? And he looked at me. He didn't tell me. My mom and me. He just looked at me and said, "Come tell me what you that thing you saw again." So that, was, that was weird. I told him the story again, and he says, "Well, my mom was standing by the time she came in the living room, and he said, well, half of the men left like during the night last night." He said, "I waited with a couple of other fellas till the morning, and we left." He said they left because something was walking around, circling the camp, two feet, two legs, breaking limbs and, and screaming back to me, just screaming, screaming, screaming. And he said it sounded like a woman being killed or a woman screaming. And, uh, you know, later in life, the only other time I heard that was on Finding Bigfoot. And they went to Toledo Bend area twice because it's so active. And uh, Bobo said, you know, around here, the Spanish, when they came, that Spanish word for them uh, translate to screaming woman. Man, I got the chills. That's the only other I heard. And since then on podcasts and whatnot, I've heard other people describe it as it sounded like a woman screaming. And... You know, he never knew what it was. I think he knew what it was, but he didn't want to say. I think he he died when I was 12. So I never got to have an adult conversation with him. I think he, more happened to him than he said. Because for him to believe, you know, believe me and to tell me those stories, there had to be more. But he didn't want to ruin my hunting and fishing. He didn't want me to know those stories just then. I really believe that. Uh, but that was really strange, man, that he uh, he believed me. And, I, you know, I wasn't getting in trouble. I was like, man, that's great. I mean, uh, and we talked about it a few times later. I used to badger him, make him tell me the story of when he was hunting. And that thing was there and the thing going around the camp and all that. I made him tell me those stories over and over. I was just hooked. 
And uh, so life goes on. I hunted and fished. Man, I stayed in the woods. And I never saw anything else. The only thing that happened to me uh, was, again, we were up in that same area around Toledo Bend. My dad had died, so my uncle started bringing me with him hunting. And uh, so my uncle, we get up, you know, way before light, it's dark. And we go in the woods, it's squirrel season again. We go in the woods and each person takes their, their spot, their stand. So he put me down by a tree and he went for the on. Well, I had a flashlight. By this time after that, I always made, I made sure I had a flashlight with fresh batteries. I would go to the store and buy batteries for every hunt. I didn't care how new those batteries were. They were going to be brand new. They were going to work. So I'm sitting, and it's pitch dark. And I'm kind of scared. You know, I'm kind of scared. You know, it's a weird area. I've heard the stories, my dad and all that. And I'm sitting there, and from behind me, all of a sudden starts what I used to call a rolling snarl or a rolling growl. The reason I say rolling is because, man, whatever it was had lungs like you wouldn't believe because this thing could growl for a minute or more, you know? Kind of like a motorcycle. And it would keep growling. Like a- yeah, I mean, it was, it, it almost sounded motorized. I mean, it was just, I mean, it just kept on, kept on. And I would whip my flash, flash out real quick and try and, I turn it all behind me, and I never saw anything. Of course, this is so thick that all I saw was just a wall of, you know, thickets. I mean, you just, I just couldn't see anything further than five feet. But that's the way it is down here. It's so thick that it's jungle-like. All you're going to see is five feet around you, even in the daytime. But anyway, so I kept doing that. And, uh, of course, after the hunt, I, I couldn't believe people didn't hear that, you know. I said, did y'all hear that, that growl? And, oh, my uncle's like, oh, that's no guy. You starting that again. Uh, you just. So he gave me a hard time about it. And then he said it was probably a uh, wild pig. And I was so mad. You know, like I didn't know what a pig sounds like, you know. I mean, come on, man. My grandfather raised pigs. Yeah. And I know wild pigs, you know, I mean that that was not a pig. You know, I guarantee you that was not a pig. Like don't now, don't insult don't what, my intelligence. Like, yeah, you know. exactly. I was I was so mad, you know. But I couldn't say anything, you know, say anything to adults up down here. But uh yeah, that was no pig. I felt totally insulted. But anyway, uh, I can't prove what it was. In my mind, I think it was something. You know, because I never heard that before, man. And uh, it really freaked me out. But anyway, later in life, you know, I went hunting everywhere, did all that, and fishing, and deep in the basin, camping. And uh, I've never seen anything like that again, ever in my life. But once, uh, one time... You know, I'm back at the levee. It's about 1995. And so I was going to go fishing. And what I would fish in is what's called borrow pits. And it's pits that were dug out to build the levee years and years ago. Well, the river, since it was dug out, the river would get high. You know, the river rises and, and drops constantly. So river water would come into these borrow pits. And then when the water went down in the river, these borrow pits would start to clear up. And man, the fishing was just tremendous. I was in one of those pits. And that's what we call them, the pits. But there's no place to launch. They're landlocked. So you have to put your boat in the back of the truck. You know, a little uh, 12-foot aluminum boat. I put it in the back of my truck, back down the levee, to the edge of the water and just pull my boat in there. And that's what I did. I was by myself. And I always used two paddles, a short paddle and a long paddle. The long paddle, of course, is the long strokes and going, you know, kind of far. 
And the little paddle was when I was there fishing, I could get it and maneuver with it, you know? And, uh, so I'm looking at, uh, the opposing bank and I'm thinking, well, where I'm going to fish. And I noticed, I'd always noticed this little depression, this dip, uh, where they had dug a little bit into the woods. I thought, man, I'm going to we always called it the corner. I said, man, I'm going to go over in the corner and I'll flip my plastic worm, see if I can get something where they had overhanging trees. I'm going to get something under them trees, you know. I know there's a bass there. And it's a bluebird day. Again, um, it's early spring, so there's not a whole lot of, there's not many bees on the tree. So I paddle over there with my long paddle. I go to the corner, get my little paddle, and I maneuver myself just right. And I start flipping my plastic worm underneath this tree. Well, the first thing I noticed when I got in there was this smell. It stunk. It smelled like garbage, and it smelled like a like something a rotting animal. But it also had the unmistakable smell of wet fur. You know, I mean, it smelled like a wet dog. Bad. I mean, the smell was just too much. So I, I get there and I start flipping and I think to myself, man, I'm going to flip this worm a few times. Then I got to go see what's, what's in there. You know, you couldn't see in there. It was all stickers and bushes and trees. And I, I figured it was right on the other side of that, that thicket patch. I said, I bet you somebody shot a late season deer poached the late season there and they shot one and it got away and it died right there. I'm thinking all this, you know? So I'm flipping under this thing and nothing. I, I get nothing. So I've been there a little while and I thought to myself, <clears throat> okay, what I'm going to do is, it's probably a deer. Maybe there's a rack or whatever they can get. But I just want to see. I was curious. So I flip a little while and I thought to myself, okay, I can't do this. This smell is just too bad. So I was going to go with my little paddle, kind of paddle up to the bank and get off, walk in the woods and go see what the hell that smell was. Well, thank God, I picked up the little paddle and it hit the side of the boat when I was going to paddle it. And it's an aluminum boat on the water. So it went, bang, you know, and right when that happened, something took off, the woods exploded in front of me, just carrying out, running on two feet. I could hear those two, boom, 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 and then boom, whoosh, it jumped in the river on the other side. I never saw it. I just know a big animal ran away on two feet and dove into the water, and the smell was gone. I mean, the smell was gone. And my mind went straight back to when I was a kid and I had that encounter. And I just instinctively went on automatic pilot. I grabbed my big paddle and I started paddling. It was, I must have broke several world records because I paddled so hard, I actually pulled my right pectoral muscle, which gave me a lot of trouble for a while. So I paddled, I paddled, paddling towards my, my uh, truck. It's backwards, you know, the tailgate uh, at the edge of the water with my trailer hitch. Now, I'm supposed to get so get out, get my boat out the water, put it in the back of my truck, tie it down and all that stuff. No way, man. I jumped out my boat on the bank. I took my rope that was connected to my boat. I would just twist, put a few rings around my, uh, my trailer hitch, jumped in my truck. I hit up the levee. I pulled my boat out of the water all the way up the levee, and I was going down the levee, which is gravel. And I kept telling myself, stop, John. You're going to ruin your boat. You're ruin. And took everything from me inside the truck. And I got out. I had to hang, put my hand on the side of the truck and compose myself. My heart, I thought I was going to have a heart attack. My heart was just beating out of my chest. And, uh, man, I got my, my stuff together, you know, a little bit. And uh, I put my boat in the truck like I was supposed to, tied it down, all that stuff, and I left. And when I got home, my wife asked me, what was wrong with you? Your body's a ghost. So I told her a story. 
Uh, now, she had an incident where we were camping right around that same place at Fossey Point State Park. And her and my brother are outside the camper. I'm in the camper. It's a pretty good-sized camper, you know, gooseneck type thing. So I'm sitting at the table in there, and it's dark. We've got the fire going. And everybody's talking, you know, it's all good. And I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, man, my ex-wife and my brother just bust through the door. And I'm like, hey, hey I'm going to break the door. And they said, there's something, there's something. And when I called them down, my, my brother and my ex-wife said, there is something crouched just outside the light with red eyes, and it's, it's hairy. And, uh, man, I ran out there. And they were really terrified. So I immediately ran out there. I thought, all right, you know, and uh, nothing. I couldn't find. They showed me where it was. They swore to me. You know, it was, it was hairy. It was crouched down, and it had red eyes. You know, so, and that was near the basin. And, and there's a few things that's happened like that. But, uh, you know, when I was young, of course, I didn't know anything about Bigfoot. You know, you know, we had three channels on our TV, and we only watched one program at night, whatever my dad was watching. So, I mean, we didn't, we didn't have that. It was later when I started, I was old enough to go to the movies, and they would have those trailers before, and they showed the Patterson film. And, I mean, I got chills. I have no doubt that thing is real. I mean, it's, you know, they've, they've checked it six ways from Sunday, and no one can disprove it. But uh, I have no doubt it's real. But, yeah, when I was, you know, deciding, man, really, really traumatized me. You know, I had to sleep with a, a, my light on, and my mom didn't knew something happened, and my dad was totally convinced. They knew something happened because I totally changed. I had to have slept with a light on until I was in high school. And I would have night terrors and nightmares. And uh, it was common knowledge. You know, I would later in life when we learned about Bigfoot, I put that name to it because that's the only thing I can figure it was. It wasn't a bear. And I know what a bear looks like. And, um, you know, I slept with the light on. I would have nightmares, night terrors. So much so that, uh, say, I would have a nightmare. I would wake up and I'd get up and go into my in the living room, and my sister would be sitting there reading a book. This happened several times, and she would just look at, up at me over her glasses and say, "Bigfoot." I'd shake my head, yes, and go sit down for a while, compose myself, and then go back to bed. Now those have gone away since I've been able to talk about it and write about it and whatnot. You know, I'm at peace with it now. But it traumatized me for years. I, I truly believe I have post-traumatic stress disorder from that. Because I do take medication for anxiety and, and depression. But my anxiety is debilitating anxiety. I mean debilitating. I, I totally believe it was because I was so traumatized at a young age. I was never that scared in all my life. All right, everyone, that's going to be it for tonight's show. But before we go, I'd like to remind you that if you haven't joined the Crypto PTSD family yet, hit that subscribe button. I'll send you a notification every week when we upload our new show. And as always, if you've had an encounter and you'd like to be a guest on the show, send me an email. My email address is CryptoPTSD at gmail.com. And make sure you put encounter in the subject line. If you're listening to us on iTunes, take that extra minute to rate and review. It really helps out the show. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in tonight, and we'll see you next week.